Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Happy All Hallows' Eve, or Happy Halloween. In my mind, Halloween is a time of year that it's time to get spooky, especially for you, the listener, me, the narrator. Any story that is designed to give you the chills is perfect. So, with today's video, I will be intermingling fictional and non-fictional pieces, two of which have, the first one has four parts, the second one has 20 parts. So, have I got a video for you. Now, along with the rain ambience, I will be playing an anxiety-inducing horror ambience underneath. Not too much, not too loud, that way you can still fall asleep without it disturbing you. Well, I think that was a good introduction. <laughs> if this is your first time to the channel, please consider joining our family by hitting the subscribe button and make sure you set your notification bell to all that way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. And without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your large dose of vocal melatonin entitled a Halloween Compilation 2024. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. So, disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Let's get spooky. Kicking things off, we're going to start with the Halloween's scariest American folklore. Axe Murder Hollow Susan and Ned were driving through a wooded, empty section of highway. Lightning flashed, thunder roared, the sky went dark in the torrential downpour. We better stop, said Susan. Ned nodded his head in agreement. He stepped on the brake, and suddenly the car started to slide on the slick pavement. They plunged off the road and slid to a halt at the bottom of an incline. Pale and shaking, Ned quickly turned to check to see if Susie was all right. When she nodded, Ned relaxed and looked through the rain-soaked windows. I'm going to see how bad it is, he told Susan, and went out into the rain. She saw his blurry figure in the headlights, walking around the front of the car. A moment later, he jumped back inside with her, soaking wet. The car's not badly damaged, but we're wheel deep in mud, he said. I'm going to have to call for help. Susan swallowed nervously. There would be no quick rescue here. He told her to turn off the headlights and lock the doors until he returned. Axe murder hollow. Although Ned hadn't said the name aloud, they both knew what he had been thinking when he told her to lock the door. This was the place where a man had once taken an axe and hacked his wife to death in a jealous rage over an alleged affair, supposedly. Supposedly, the axe-wielding spirit of the husband continued to haunt the section of the road. Outside the car, Susan heard a shriek, a loud thump, and a strange gurgling noise but she couldn't see anything in the darkness. Frightened, she shrank back into her seat. She sat in silence for a while, and then she noticed another sound. Bump, bump, bump. It was a soft sound, like something being blown by the wind. Suddenly, the car was illuminated by a bright light. An official-sounding voice told her to get out of the car. Ned must have found a police officer. Susan unlocked the door and stepped out of the car. As her eyes adjusted to the bright light, she saw it. Hanging by his feet from the tree next to the car was the dead body of Ned. His bloody throat had been cut so deep that he was nearly decapitated. The wind swung his corpse back and forth so that it thumped against the tree. Bump, bump, bump. Susan screamed and ran towards the voice and the light. As she drew close, she realized the light was not coming from a flashlight. Standing there was the glowing figure of a man with a smile on his face 
and a large, solid, and definitely real axe in his hands. She backed away from the glowing figure until she bumped into the car. Playing around when my back was turned, the ghost whispered, stroking the sharp blade of an axe with his fingers. You've been very naughty. The last thing she saw was the glint of the axe blade in the eerie, incandescent light. Black Magic Mad Henry was a hermit who lived alone in a decrepit mansion at the edge of town. Rumors were rife about the wide-eyed man. Some folks said that he was a magician who called upon the powers of darkness to wreak havoc upon his neighbors. Others called him a mad doctor who could restore life to foul corpse from the local cemetery. No respectable citizen in town had anything to do with Mad Henry. Then, one year, a new family moved into town with a lovely daughter, Rachel, who caught Mad Henry's eye. He showered the maiden with gifts, goblets of pure gold, necklaces of pearl, and a pot of daisies that never dropped a single petal. Despite the gifts, Rachel fell in love with another, Jeffrey, a handsome young man, just home from university. A week after meeting, they eloped, leaving behind a stunned Mad Henry. When Rachel and Jeffrey returned from the elopement, they threw a big ball and invited everyone in town. When Rachel was waltzing with her father, she heard a clap of thunder. Lightning flashed again and again. Suddenly, the double doors blew open and a breeze whirled in, bringing with it the smell of dead, decaying things. Mad Henry loomed in the doorway, pupils gleaming red with anger. He was followed by the grotesque figures of the dead, who came marching two by two into the room. Their eye sockets glowed with blue fire as they surrounded the room. Two of the corpses captured Jeffrey and threw them down at the feet of their lord. Red eyes gleaming, Mad Henry drew a silver-bladed knife and casually cut the bridegroom's throat from ear to ear. Rachel screamed and ran forward, pushing through the foul, stinking corpses of the dead and flung herself upon her dying husband. Kill us both, she cried desperately. But Mad Henry plucked the lass out of the pool of blood surrounding her dead husband and carried her out into the thundering night. Behind him, the army of the dead turned from the grisly scene and followed their master. The sounds of thunder and lightning faded away as the alchemist and his dead companions disappeared into the night. Jeffrey's father and Rachel's father gathered a small mob and followed the evil hermit, intent upon saving Rachel. When they reached Mad Henry's house, they found it completely empty, save for a light, which shone from a series of mysterious globes that bobbed near the ceiling of each room. Mad Henry had vanished. Search parties scoured the countryside for days, but turned up nothing. Jeffrey was buried in the local cemetery, and the dance hall was torn down. No one in town spoke about what happened, and no one dared imagine what had become of poor Rachel. A year to the day of the ball, a timid knock sounded upon the door of Rachel's parents' home. When her father opened it, he saw a gaunt, gray figure on the stoop. Her eyes were dull with exhaustion and pain. It was Rachel. Her tongue had been cut out so she couldn't speak. But when she produced a knife from her tattered garments, the knife with a silver blade they had last seen in the hands of Mad Henry, the gleam of satisfaction in Rachel's eyes told them that the streaks of blood that coated the knife were those of Mad Henry. That night, Rachel died in her sleep with a peaceful smile upon her ravaged face. 
Bloody Mary. She lived deep in the woods in a tiny cottage and sold herbal remedies for a living. Folks living in the town nearby called her Bloody Mary and said she was a witch. None dared cross the old crone for fear that their cows would go dry, their food sources rot away before winter, their children take sick of fever, or any number of terrible things that an angry witch could do to her neighbors. Then, the little girls in the village began to disappear, one by one. No one could find out where they had gone. Grief-stricken families searched the woods, the local buildings, and all the houses and barns, and there was no sign of the missing girls. A few brave souls even went to Bloody Mary's home in the woods to see if the witch had taken the girls, but she denied any knowledge of the disappearances. Still, it was noted that her haggard appearance had changed. She looked younger, more attractive. The neighbors were suspicious, but they could find no proof that the witch had taken their young ones. Then came the night when the daughter of the miller rose from her bed and walked outside, following an enchanted sound no one else could hear. The miller's wife had a toothache and was sitting up in the kitchen, treating the tooth with an herbal remedy when her daughter left the house. She screamed for her husband and followed the girl out of the door. The miller came running in his t-shirt. Together, they tried to restrain the girl, but she kept breaking away from them and heading out of town. The desperate cries of the miller and the wife woke the neighbors. They came to assist the frantic couple. Suddenly, a sharp-eyed farmer gave a shout and pointed towards a straight light at the edge of the woods. A few townsmen followed him out of the field and saw Bloody Mary standing beside a large oak tree, holding a magic wand that was pointed towards the Miller house. She was glowing with an unearthly light as she set her evil spell upon the Miller's daughter. The townsmen grabbed their guns and their pitchfork and ran towards the witch. When she heard the commotion, Bloody Mary broke off her spell and fled back into the woods. The far-sighted farmer had loaded his gun with silver bullets in case the witch ever came after his daughter. Now he took aim and shot at her. The bullet hit Bloody Mary in the hip and she fell to the ground. The angry townsmen leapt upon her and carried her back into the field, where they built a huge bonfire and burned her at the stake. As she burned, Bloody Mary screamed a curse at the villagers. If anyone mentioned her name aloud before a mirror, she would send her spirit to revenge herself upon them for her terrible death. When she was dead, the villagers went to the house in the wood and found the unmarked graves of the little girls the evil witch had murdered. She had used their blood to make her young again. From that day to this, anyone foolish enough to chant Bloody Mary's name three times before a darkened mirror will summon the vengeful spirit of the witch. It is said that she will tear their bodies to pieces and rip their souls from their mutilated bodies. The souls of these unfortunate ones will burn in torment as Bloody Mary once was burned, and they will be trapped forever in the mirror. Bloody Mary Wales Old Man Wells was an evil man who loved money more than anything in the world, except his wife. When his beloved wife died in childbirth, Wells fell to pieces. He hated the world, a little girl named Mary that had killed his wife. He neglected her, dressing her in rags, making her do all the farm chores and half-starving her. In spite of this cruel treatment, Mary grew into a sweet girl who loved her wicked father. As Mary reached adulthood, the resemblance of her dead mother was striking. 
Wells saw his dead wife every time he looked at the daughter who had caused her death. One night, after a hefty bout of drinking, Wells lumbered into Mary's bedroom and stabbed her repeatedly. Mary woke up screaming and thrashed around in agony, trying to fight off her demonic father as blood spurted everywhere and bits of torn flesh littered the bedclothes and fell to the floor. When she was dead, old man Wells carried her down to the basement, dug an indifferent grave and tossed her body into it. Two nights later, when old man Wells came back from doing his nightly chores, he found Mary standing in the kitchen, her nearly severed head lolling against one shoulder as she stirred an empty kettle. The pool of streaming blood lay beneath her feet, and bits of skin from her knife-slashed face were breaking off and falling into the kettle. Father... Bloody Mary hissed. Old man Wells screamed and leapt out the kitchen door. When he glanced over his shoulder, the apparition was gone. A week later, old man Wells looked up from reading the newspaper to find Bloody Mary sitting in the chair opposite him, her knife slash dress covered in blood. Her tattered hands were busy knitting him a shirt. Father... She hissed through knife-scored lips. Blood fell from her body like rain as she flew across the room towards him, knitting needles held like knives. Old man Wells fled from the house in panic with two deep cuts scored across his back. Old man Wells cowered in the barn for several days, afraid to go near his house. After nearly a week of sleeping in the hay and eating raw food from the garden, he decided it was safe to return to his house. The spirit must be gone by now. Old man Wells hurried into the kitchen, eager for a wash and a shave after sleeping so many nights in the barn. He pumped an ear of water and took it over to the little shaving mirror they kept on the far side wall. When he looked into the mirror, old man Wells saw the glowing red eyes and knife-scorned face of Bloody Mary. Her once fair lips were split down the center and blood dribbled from them as she smiled evilly. Father, she hissed, raising blood-stained fingers. Her nails were long and sharpened like the claws of a beast. She reached out of the mirror and slapped her father twice across the face. Old Manuel screamed, blood streaming from four slashes on his cheeks. He ran from the house and leapt into the safety of the barn, his heart pounding so hard his chest ached from it. Father. A voice hissed softly a few paces to his right. Old man Wells screamed and whirled around. Bloody Mary stood smiling at him through her blood-stained, razor-sharp teeth. Her tattered tongue was bleeding from several places as if it had been scored by a butcher's knife. She pointed above her head, and old man Wells saw a noose hanging from the rafters beside the ladder to the loft. The rope looked inviting. Hanging there in a dust-speckled sunbeam, obediently, old man Wells placed his hands on the rung of the ladder and started to climb. The Burnt Church She was sophisticated, poised, and cultured. In retrospect, this should have made them suspicious. A teacher like her should be presiding over a girls' school in London or New York, not seeking a position in a small town in Georgia. But at the time, they were too delighted by her application to ask questions. It will be good for our daughter to learn some culture, the attorney's wife told the preacher's wife. And our boy may find some table manners at last, the pastor's wife responded with a smile. School was called into session at the local church shortly after the arrival of the teacher. 
and soon the children were bringing glowing reports home. Teacher was special. Teacher taught them manners and dictation, as well as reading, writing, and arithmetic. All the children loved her. The parents were delighted by the progress their children were making at school. The teacher had been a real find. A godsend, said the preacher's wife. But not everyone in town was so satisfied. The local never-do-well called Smith had more sinister stories to tell. That woman ain't natural, he told the blacksmith, waving a bottle of whiskey for emphasis. I seen her out in the woods after dark, dancing around a campfire and chanting in a strange language. Nonsense, the blacksmith retorted, calmly hammering a headed iron bar on his anvil. They say she's got an altar in her room, and it ain't an altar to the Almighty, Smith insisted, leaning forward and blowing his boozy breath into the blacksmith's face. You're drunk, said the blacksmith, lifting the hot iron so it bared the man from coming any closer. Go home and sleep it off. Smith left the smithy, but he continued to talk wild about the teacher in the weeks that followed. During those weeks, a change gradually came over the schoolchildren. The typical hijinks and pranks that all children played lessened. Their laughter died away, and when they did misbehave, it was on a much more ominous scale than before. Items began to disappear from houses and farms. Expensive items like jewelry, farm tools, and money. When children talked back to their parents, there was a hard edge to their voices, and they did not apologize for their rudeness, even when punished. And my daughter lied to me the other day, the attorney's wife said to the pastor's wife in distress. I saw her punch her younger brother and steal an apple from him, and she denied it to my face. She practically called me a liar. The games the children played back in the woods frightened me. The pastor's wife confessed. They chant in a strange language, and they move in such a strange manner, almost like a ritual dance. Could it be something that they are learning at school? Asked the attorney's wife. Surely not. Teacher is such a sweet, sophisticated lady, said the pastor's wife. But they exchanged uneasy glances. Smith, on the other hand, was sure. That teacher's turning them young'uns to the devil. That's what she's doing, he proclaimed up and down the streets of the town. Don't be ridiculous, the preacher told him when they passed by in front of the mercantile. My ain't ridiculous. You were blind, Smith said. That teacher ought to be burned at the stake like they burned the witches in Salem. The pastor, pale with wrath, ordered Smith out of his sight. But the never-do-well's words rang in his mind and would not be pushed away, and the children continued to behave oddly, almost like they were possessed. He would, the preacher decided reluctantly, have to look into it some day soon. The day came sooner than he thought. The very next Monday, his little boy came down with a cold, and his mother kept him home from school. When the pastor returned from his duties for a late lunch, his wife came running to him as soon as he entered the door. She was pale with fright. I heard him chanting something over and over again in his bedroom, she gasped. So I crept to the door to listen. He was saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. The pastor gasped and clutched his Bible to his chest as goosebumps erupted over his body. This was positively satanic, and there was nowhere the boy could have learned such a thing in this town unless he learned it at school. At that moment, the attorney's wife came bursting in the door behind them. Quick, pastor, quick, she cried. Smith is running through the town with a torch, talking about burning down the school. The children are still in class. The pastor raced out of the house with the two women at his heels. 
They and the other townsfolk who followed them were met by a huge cloud of smoke coming from the direction of the church, where the children had their lessons. The building was already ablaze as frantic parents beat at the flames with wet socks and threw buckets of water from the pump into the inferno. Smith could be heard cackling unrepentantly from the far side of the building, which was full of the screams of the trapped students and the teacher. The fire blazed with a supernatural kind of force, and the pastor thought he heard the sound of the teacher laughing from within the building when it became apparent that no one could be saved. The church burnt for several hours, and when it finally extinguished, there was nothing left. Mourning parents tried to find something of their children to bury, and Smith wisely disappeared from town. His mission against the works of Satan completed. The teacher's burnt body was buried deep in the ground and covered with brick tomb. The children's bodies were interred beneath wooden crosses. Of all the students in the school that fall, only the pastor's small son survived. To this day, voices can be heard in the graveyard of that burnt church, chanting unintelligible words as the school children and the teacher once chanted in the woods outside town. Sometimes apparitions are seen in dark walkers who roam the graveyard at night, and they say that a brick taken from the grave of the evil teacher can set fire to objects of which they are placed. I try not to cater to anyone in specific, but one of my elite members has been dying to hear one of these stories. So, for Tina Mead, this next story is for you. It does have a part one and part two, so I really hope you enjoy. And all the other listeners, I hope you enjoy as well. I just wanted to put that out there for you. Here we go. Let's start with some background on me right now. I am working at one of these haunted mazes for the month of October. It pays minimum wage so I get a little spending money to get me through college. Our maze is a corn maze slash haunted house. I'm not one of those people who get to jump out with a bloody mask and scare the visitors. I'm the girl who works the picture counter. You see, the maze I work at takes a picture of you when you go through a certain part of it, and then at the end of the maze you can see the picture of you and your friends looking ridiculous and scared, and you can buy it for five bucks. It's actually pretty fun to see everyone's faces. There are some pretty hilarious ones. So I've been working here for a few weeks, a couple of nights a week, a lot of people who come through, hundreds and every single one of them have been caught screaming, jumping, staring into horror, etc. At one point where the picture is taken, but Friday night, that changed. At about 8.30 p.m., a picture loaded onto my computer, and I set to print it. I was told, through text, that it was a party of one, so I should print only one copy. I got ready to do so and glanced at the picture. It was a single man completely dressed in black, head adorned with a jet black bowler hat. He wasn't screaming, wasn't cringing away. He was facing right at the camera, his face shrouded in shadow. It really did unnerve me. I had never seen someone not react, never, but Whatever, maybe he was just used to it, or maybe someone told him what to expect. I got over my night, selling people their funny memories. Just as we were shutting down at around 11, I was packing up the unsold pictures when I saw the man's picture again. Then I realized I had never seen him to ask if he wanted to buy it. It was odd, as they had to pass my kiosk to get out of the maze. I decided not to let it worry me and drove home. But here's where it gets crazy and really weird. 
Okay, so I went back to work yesterday, aka Saturday, and did my job until around 8.30. And then the picture came through. Party of one, man completely in black, not scared, staring at the camera. But this time, I could sort of see his face. He was smiling in the most frightening way possible, practically all of his teeth showing. I felt sick to my stomach and actually wanted to leave, but I couldn't, obviously, as Saturdays are our busiest night. Finally, the end of the night rolled around and he never came to get his photo. Again, I told my boss to come check it out, showed them both photos, and told him how the guy never showed up to see me. I was visibly shaken, but he told me not to worry about it that it was probably some practical joker who was trying to freak us out or something. But I really am worried. Guys, what should I do? I work again tonight, so I'll update you tomorrow. But I'm freaking out. What if he comes back? What if he knows I'm working this kiosk and knows I see his pictures? Okay, here's an update about some questions that I got. First off, I want to respond to the comments about the corn harboring evil beings. What are they? What do they want to do to me? I do live in a place with a rich Native American history. Is that related? Anyway, here's a recount of last night. So, I'm convinced the man, or whatever he is, knows who I am, and that I'm here, and I think he's purposefully here just for me. Last night, Sunday, I asked my boss if I could have someone work with me because I was nervous. However, he denied my request because he didn't have any extra people working, which I get. I guess Sundays aren't busy this early before Halloween most years, but this was turning out to be, so he didn't prepare me for needing a bodyguard. He said he would come over every hour or so to check up on me, if I wanted him to. I felt kind of stupid and childish. It was early into the night, so it was still light out and everything felt okay, you know. I was lured into a false sense of security, I suppose. So I told him it was fine and I would just keep in contact and tell him if things got weird. Well. They did get weird. At around 7.45 or so, I realized I had to pee. So I texted my boss and asked if he would send someone over to cover for me. He didn't reply, which is really odd because he usually texts back super fast to maintain order if something is going awry. When he finally replied to me, it was 8.21. I know because I was glancing at my phone every 30 seconds. He said he would send the girl working the ticket counter. I'm going to call her Alex, even though that's not her real name because I'm paranoid. To switch with me for a bit, and he would work tickets. As soon as Alex got to the photo kiosk, I practically ran to the bathroom, which is actually just some nasty porta potties, because I had to pee way too badly. There was a line, of course, and I stood waiting impatiently. Just as I was about to go in, movement to my left caught my attention. I looked over there, which is just more empty cornfield that isn't part of the maze. It stretches on for miles. And I saw him. I freaking saw him standing there, guys. In the corn. That same sinister smile on his face. I looked around and noticed... There was no line. No people were around me. My blood ran cold and my heart was beating faster than ever. I swear it. I jumped into the porta potty, locked myself in, and threw up. I started crying like a little baby, shaking and heaving. I literally stayed in there for 15 minutes. As I walked back, I kept my eyes straight ahead, pointedly ignoring the cornfield beside me. As soon as I got back to the photo kiosk, Alex noticed I was messed up and she texted our boss. He couldn't leave the ticket counter unmanned, 
So, he told Alex to just stay with me until I was okay. I had this irrational fear of letting people down, so I reassured her that I was fine and that she should go work tickets and that I would be fine. I'm stupid sometimes, but it's just this thing I have. I hate letting people down, so much so that I am willing to be terrified alone at that damn kiosk for another two hours. It's dumb, I know. So. Alex left, rather reluctantly, I think, and I was alone again. By this time, it was almost 9 p.m. I decided to look at the pictures from around 8.30 to see if he had gone through. He hadn't. I think he knew I wasn't at the kiosk, and that's why he was in the corn by the bathrooms and not in the maze. I don't understand what I possibly did to make him come after me. Maybe he's not evil. Maybe he just has a message for me or maybe something else. I know I should just quit this job, but I can't stomach the thought of leaving them all with no one. It's hard to get someone and train them and everything this close to Halloween because it's always so busy. I also don't want to just leave because I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach, an almost primal fear, that no matter where I go, he is going to follow me. Part 2 Okay, so to start off, shit is going down. I've never been more afraid in my life. I just want to note that I don't live in Indiana. But I do live in the Midwest, where Native American culture is prevalent, and corn is a huge crop there. So anyways, I took your advice and I went today to quit. Because, as a few of you said, I figured that you were right and it's not worth to go insane because of a stupid minimum wage job. So, I went back today, Tuesday, even though I didn't work. I felt very uncomfortable and sick to my stomach at the thought of having to quit. But I figured my boss would understand because of the crazy circumstances I was being faced with, even if he didn't believe me. It wasn't like I was quitting because I found something better, or I was just being too lazy to do something. I was feeling like I was under attack. I barely slept at all last night. My roommate probably hates me because I jolted upright at every creak, groan, and thud, but I digress. I got to the maze at around 5, making sure I would be there when it was still light out, but late enough in the day that my boss would be around. I headed to the box office where my boss usually hangs out for the beginning of the nights. He was sitting in his desk chair, just kind of staring at the window on the wall overlooking the corn. I knocked lightly before coming into the room. He moved his head disturbingly, quickly to face me. His eyes were black. I'm not kidding you. They were jet black. I gasped audibly and stepped back out of instinct. He stood up and started moving towards me. I know I had left the door open, but for some reason it had closed, perhaps from the wind. Though it wasn't all that windy as I recall, I fumbled around searching for the doorknob. When it suddenly opened and Alex, my co-worker, appeared. She looked uncomfortable as I was obviously terrified. My boss was coming towards me and the door had been closed. The whole situation seemed very sketchy, which I guess it was. Is everything okay in here? She asked, a puzzled look on her face. We were just needing some help fixing the camera in the maze. It's not taking pictures for some reason. I looked back at my boss and his eyes had gone back to their natural kind of blue. He smiled at Alex moving around me to go out the door to help them. He turned back to me. Uh, did you need something? He asked. I stuttered and glanced nervously around the room. Uh, yeah, I squeaked making my answer come out like a question. Okay, 
Well, just let me fix the camera, then I'll talk to you about it, whatever it is. He smiled benevolently. If I hadn't seen his obsidian black eyes moments ago, I would have thought he looked so kind, so normal. But now I could barely look at him without my stomach dropping to my knees. Uh, on second thought, why don't you go stand in the photo kiosk while we check the camera, he said. You work the booth and we'll try to trip the camera. You can tell us if it is working or not. I'll text you when we're in there and you can check the photo. I nodded soberly, trudging over to the kiosk like the obedient little worker bee that I am. When I got to the kiosk, I booted up the computer and got ready for the text to come in with my instructions. It didn't come. Not for a long time. I got bored, so I decided to look around the old pictures. When I clicked on Friday's album, I noticed something very strange. All the pictures had been erased from a certain time frame, from 826 to 832. There were no photos. Now, on busy nights, and weekends are always busy, there is a picture taken about every two to three minutes because we tried to put about two minutes in between each group of visitors we let into the maze. That means there were at least one picture, but possibly two or three, that had been completely deleted. And I know that at around 8.30ish is when the man in black had come through. I totally wish I would have saved those damn pictures somewhere else. I quickly checked Saturday, and the same thing happened there. All the pictures from 826 to 832 were gone, vanished without a trace. I got chills and I felt like I was being watched. Suddenly, my phone vibrated in my back pocket, making me jump. I was breathing hard when I checked the text. It was from my boss. All it said was, now. Why the hell was he being weird and vague? I figured he just meant that they had tripped the wire and I should check if a picture had been taken. I checked. Nothing. I refreshed the program, but still no picture had been taken in the last 18 hours. I texted back that nothing was happening, so it was definitely broken. He texted back, literally instantly. Check. Now. I was irritated. Seriously? It had been like five seconds, but I did as I was told because, like I mentioned before, I'm stupid. There was a new photo. I was about to text him back that the camera was back up, but then I clicked on the photo. It was the man, still in all black, standing there. This time, his head was cocked to the right, but he was still sneering. I gasped, slapped my hand over my mouth, and tripping backwards over the computer cords. I landed hard on the concrete floor of the kiosk, and then jumped up to go check what the hell was happening in that room. I raced over to the room where the camera was housed. It took me about 30 seconds to navigate there, and no one was in there when I got there. I had sprinted, so I was panting and sweaty. I called out for Alex, for my boss, but neither answered me. Suddenly, something crashed beside me. I saw a flash of light and I jumped, screaming, glancing around wildly in search of the cause of the noise. I decided I wasn't staying in there for one more second. So, I sprinted outside into the fading daylight. Alex and my boss were standing outside, staring at me. Uh, what's wrong? Alex asked, walking over to me. I couldn't force my words out. I was on the verge of tears, and I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Did our picture show up? She asked. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. Well, we didn't see the telltale flash, so I don't think it's working, she said disappointedly. I tried to conceal my fear as I knew that a picture had been taken, and I knew who was in it, too. But I didn't bring it up. 
My boss came over to me and clapped me on the shoulder. Thanks for helping us out with that, but we're going to have to get somebody more techie to help us find the problem. He smiled almost menacingly at me before walking away. I continued to stand in the same spot, sedentary and shaking. Suddenly, my boss turned around to face me once again. Hey, what did you want to talk to me about? He asked. I really couldn't focus on anything or even remember why I was there. I just stared stupidly at him for a while until I finally remembered. Exhaling sharply, I just told him straight up I had to quit due to personal reasons. School, work, blah, blah, blah. For some reason, I felt like I shouldn't bring up the pictures since I no longer had proof. I also didn't say anything about the new picture of the man. I don't know if it's still on the computer, nor do I want to find out. I'm too disturbed. Is my boss in on it? Was he possessed? Why were his freaking eyes black? But here's the worst part. I got home tonight and started to write this up for you guys so it was fresh in my memory. And as I was doing so, I decided to check my email. I got an email from an unknown address. I saved the picture and put it on here. I'm not super good at the whole technology Reddit thing, so I don't know if these links will work. But I got this picture. That flash I saw in the house must have been the camera going off, capturing by a moment of fear after the crash, but Alex said the camera wasn't working. I'm all kinds of confused and all kinds of worried. Who sent this to me? Is the camera broken or not? What is happening to me? Please, somebody, help me. The next set of five American folklore stories. Dispatched. There was something odd in the tone of the dispatcher's voice when he called to tell me a person needed picking up at a Bramlett Road late one summer night in 1947. I shuddered when I heard the name of the street. I did not want to go anywhere near that area, especially at midnight. But I drove a yellow cab, and it was my job to pick up a call when it came. So I swallowed and headed toward Bramlett Road and the slaughter yards. I'd been out of town when the incident happened. I call it an incident, but it was murder, plain and not so simple. A fellow name of Brown who drove a cab with our company was robbed and stabbed to death in his own cab. Next day, a man named Willie Earl was picked up by the police the very next day and put in jail for the crime, though he denied doing it. Then, a bunch of hotheads who drove cabs for our company gathered together, passed around a bottle of whiskey, and talking about getting the fellow who stabbed Brown. One of the men went out and borrowed a shotgun, and the mob drove to the jail, grabbed Earl and threw him in the back of one of the cabs. The hotheads took him to the slaughter yards, and they dragged Earl forcibly from the cab and started beating him. A man put a knife and waded into the mob with it, and Earl shouted, Lord, you've killed me. That's when the fellow with the shotgun put a bullet in his head, reloaded, and shot him twice more. When the mob was sure he was dead, they climbed back into their separate cabs and fanned out, each heading back to the city by a different route. Eventually, word got out and 31 fellows were arrested for the crime, but they were all acquitted by a jury of their peers. After the incident, the slaughterhouse section of Bramlett Road got a bad reputation. No one in the cab company much liked driving there, especially at night. Folks claimed it was haunted by the ghost of Willie Earl. 
I shivered as I pulled on to Bramlett Road and slowed down to look for my passenger. No one was there. I parked the cab and got out to have a quick smoke while I waited. All at once, the temperature around me plummeted. I froze in place, suddenly terrified as someone moaned in terror from the other side of the road. The sound scraped my nerves raw. I could hear the unmistakable thud of hammering fists, and the darkness was filled with swirling black silhouettes pounding on something. Or someone. I fumbled for the icy cold door handle as a man shouted agony. Lord, you've killed me. I threw myself into the cab as a gun exploded, cutting off the man's cries. The shot swiftly followed by two more. I squealed the tires as I spun the cab around, a tall battered figure that glowed just enough for me to see it, lolling head. The blood-stained, dead features, the knife-torn clothes blocked the road in front of me. I gasped, floored the gas pedal, and swerved around it, heart hammering so hard it hurt my ribs. I was still trembling when I slammed into the office a few minutes later and told the dispatchers I was quitting. Then I grabbed my things and headed for home, lickety split. There was no way I was going to Bramlett Road ever again. And I never did. Don't turn on the light. She commanded the room in her basement of her dorm as soon as she realized she would have to pull an all-nighter in order to prepare tomorrow's final exam. Her roommate, Jenna, liked to get to bed early, so she packed up everything she thought she would need and went downstairs to study, and study, and study some more. It was two o'clock when she realized that she'd left out one of her textbooks upstairs on her bed. With a dramatic sigh, she rose and climbed the stairs slowly to her third floor dorm room. The lights were dim in the long hallway and the old boards creaked under her weary dread. She reached her room and turned the handle as softly as she could, pushing the door open just enough to slip inside so that the hall lights wouldn't wake her roommate. The room was filled with a strange metallic smell. She frowned a bit, her arms breaking out into chills. There was a strange feeling of malice in the room, as if a malevolent gaze were fixed upon her. It was a mind trick. The all-nighter was catching up with her. She could hear Jessica breathing on the far side of the room, a heavy sound almost as if she had been running. Jenna must have picked up a cold during the last tense week before finals. She crept along the wall until she reached her bed, groping among the covers for the stray history textbook. In the silence, she could hear a steady drip, drip, drip sound. She sighed silently. Facilities would have to come to fix the sink in the bathroom yet again. Her fingers closed on the textbook. She picked it up softly and withdrew from the room as silently as she could. Relieved to be out of the room, she hurried back downstairs, collapsed into an overstuffed chair and studied until six o'clock. She finally decided enough was enough. If she slipped upstairs now, she could get a couple hours sleep before her nine o'clock exam. The first of the sun's rays were beaming through the windows as she slowly slid the door open, hoping not to awaken Jenna. Her nose was met by an earthly metallic smell a second before her eyes registered the scene in her dorm room. Jenna was spread eagle on top of her bed against the far wall, her throat cut from ear to ear, her nightdress stained with blood. Two drops of blood fell from the saturated blanket with a drip-drip noise that sounded like a leaky faucet. Scream after scream poured from her mouth, but she couldn't stop herself anymore. Then she could cease wringing her hands. All along the hallway, doors slammed and footsteps came running down the passage. Within moments, other students had gathered in her doorway, 
and one of her friends gripped her arm with a shaking hand and pointed a trembling finger towards the wall. Her eyes widened in shock at what she saw. Then she fainted into her friend's arms. On the wall above her bed, written in her roommate's blood, were the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Hatchet Man There were warnings all over campus about a hatchet man who was supposedly abused and killed a woman in Bloomington. All the girls were warned to walk in pairs and to stay in brightly lit areas if they had to go out at night. The sophomore and her roommate were staying in the empty dorm over Thanksgiving break, since both their families were out of the country. They grown very bored as day followed boring day and night followed boring night. Tired of staying inside every night for fear of the hatchet man, her roommate suggested that they have dinner at the local bar and the sophomore agreed. The two women had lingered longer than anticipated, and it was almost midnight when the sophomore, more than a little drunk, decided to walk back to her dorm. Her roommate was busy flirting with the bartender, so she headed into the dark, silent streets alone. The sophomore had forgotten all about the hatchet man warnings. It wasn't until she took a shortcut through a dark, creepy alley that she remembered there was a desperate murderer on the loose. The sophomore shivered, feeling suddenly sober and very much alone. She felt as if hostile eyes were peering out at her from every menacing shadow and darkened doorway. She quickened her pace. Was that heavy breathing she heard behind her? Were those footsteps walking in time with her own? The sophomore broke into a run heart pounding fiercely, sure that someone was following her. She darted onto the campus, zigzagged through the buildings and flung herself panting into the dorm. She pounded up three flights of stairs, down the hall and slammed into her room, locking the door behind her. It was only then, leaning against the door with her heart racing, that she started to feel foolish. There was no sound from the hallway. No footsteps. No heavy breathing. No hatchet breaking through the wood of the door. She'd been a fool. The sophomore staggered to the bathroom to wash up for the night, leaving the door locked behind her. She kept glancing in the mirror to make sure that everything was secure. The scene in the mirror was normal and there was no sound in the empty dormitory. Everything was just fine, she told herself. Then she remembered that her roommate was still at the bar. She didn't want her roommate to walk home alone, so she called the bar and asked the manager if she would arrange for her roommate to be brought home in a taxi. The music in the background was loud, and she wasn't sure if the manager understood her request, but at least she tried. The sophomore curled up in bed with the reading lamp on, determined to wait up for her roommate. But the combination of heavy drinking and her earlier fright sent her into a deep sleep almost at once, and she did not awaken until the sun came pouring into the window early the next morning. She woke with a hangover and rolled over trying not to be sick in the bed. When she looked across the room, she realized that her roommate wasn't in the bed on the far wall. In fact, it looked as if her bed had not been slept in at all. She rolled to her feet, heart pounding with dread. Maybe her roommate had spent the night in the lobby? Her roommate had done that once before, went out partying until the wee hours of the morning, saying it was too much trouble to climb three flights of stairs. With trembling hands, the sophomore unlocked the door and wrenched it open in search of her roommate. The unmistakable, faintly metallic scent of blood smashed into her nostrils as the door swung open. That was her only warning before her shocked eye saw blood splattered all over the walls and floor of the third floor hallway. 
She screamed in terror, leaping backward away from the partially decapitated body of her roommate, which lay dead at her feet. Her throat was slit from end to end, and blood pooled under her dead body. The nails on her outstretched hands were torn and splintered, where they had scratched desperately at the wooden door. A black shadow lay across her roommate's body. She looked up in a daze. Her gaze followed the black shadow to its source. Embedded in the window frame near the entrance to the staircase was a blood-stained hatchet, outlined in the light of the rising sun. Heartbeat. Something was going on. Jason felt it in his bones. Polly was too happy, too cheerful. No woman could be that upbeat and still be faithful to her husband. Jason sat down to a delicious, warm meal every night, and Polly sang to herself as she washed up. What kind of woman could be cheerful doing dishes? Try as he might, Jason never heard anything that hinted of a secret romance. It drove him crazy. Life was not this perfect. Maybe Polly was seeing the milkman or the grocer. Jason started getting up early in order to see who it was that delivered the milk. Much to his disappointment, the fellow looked as if he'd been born several centuries ago. Then, Jason started doing the food shopping and checked out every single male employee in the local grocery store. They were either antediluvian relics, like the milkman, or still in diapers. Later that month, Jason was over at his father-in-law's house, working in the garage, when he overheard his father-in-law call to Hank, Polly's high school boyfriend. Now he knew. He knew why Polly was so happy all the time. Her parents must have told her that Hank was coming home, and she was planning to run off with him. Enraged with jealousy, Jason was waiting in the kitchen when Polly got back from church. He was beyond reason. He snatched up a newly sharpened steak knife, howling, You've cut out my heart, and now I'll cut out yours. Jason leapt around the table and ripped Polly's still beating heart out of her chest. Blood streaming everywhere, he sailed out the back door into the dark night and flung her heart, still thumping, over the side of the bridge that spanned the creek next to their home. Jason cleaned up the blood-stained house with extreme care and buried Polly's body deep in the woods, outside of town. Then he wrote several letters, carefully mimicking Polly's handwriting, and mailed them to himself and her parents. Within a few days, everyone in town believed that Polly had been secretly seeing a man from the next town, and they had run away together. Late one evening, he went out to the bridge to gloat and triumph over his unfaithful wife. Polly had gotten what she deserved, he thought. As he stood staring at the water, he became aware of a vibration under his feet. Da dum, da dum, da dum. It floated softly through the air, a simple rhythmic thudding. Da dum, da dum. Da dum. Jason's hands began to tingle as he recognized the soft, thudding sound. It was the same beat he had felt when he held Polly's bleeding heart in his hands. Da dum, da dum, da dum. The heartbeat rang in his ears, thundering so loud that he was afraid it would wake the neighbors. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Jason clapped his hands over his ears and ran back to the house, but he could not escape the terrible sound. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Even the floorboard seemed to vibrate to the slow, steady rhythm. Da dum, da dum, da dum. It sounded like a heartbeat. Polly's heartbeat. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Jason screamed in terror and flung himself out of the house. Running towards the bridge as the heartbeat grew louder and louder in his ears, Jason leaned over the railing. Curse you, Polly! He shouted. Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. 
With a wild shriek, Jason flung himself headfirst off the bridge like a diver and was smashed to death on the rocks below. Underfoot on the bridge, the pavement still vibrates to the beat of a dead heart. For now and always. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Jack O'Lantern. After a long day of unlucky hunting, I found myself stuck in the middle of the marshlands for the night. Without a flashlight or a lantern to guide my stumbling steps, the OI settled beside a fallen log to rest until daylight. As I tossed and turned, I recalled the story of my great uncle told me about a ghost that haunted the marshlands. There was once a man named Jack who was a nasty fellow. He beat his wife and kids and was an all-around bad chap. Jack got worse and worse as the years rolled by. But finally, Jack's body got so wore out that he died. He went up to heaven, but St. Peter refused to let such a wretched fellow in. Then, he went to hell, but the devil barred the door as soon as he saw Jack coming and wouldn't let him in either. Go away and don't come back, the devil told Jack. How am I supposed to get back in the dark? Jack grumbled. Give me a lantern. So, the devil threw a chunk of molten fire out to Jack, who took it for his lantern and went back to Earth, where he wanders forever through the swamps and marshlands of the Earth a bitter spirit whose only delight was in luring the unwary to their doom with his lamp. At this juncture, in my musing, I happened to look out over the marshes and noticed a blinking light in the fog. Is that you, Jack-o'-lantern? I called jovially. Jack, Jack, Jack. A voice whispered back. I was seriously spooked. I clutch my gun to my chest, the hair on my arms standing on end. Had that been an echo of my voice, or was someone out here with me? Who's there? I shouted, trying to sound brave and menacing. I waved my gun around. Show yourself at once! Jack. 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 The voice hissed back from a completely different section of the swamp. A light blinked on and then off, on and then off. Shudders ran up and down my spine at the sound of that ghastly voice coming from nowhere. I huddled up against the log, wanting something firm at my back. Suddenly, the story of jack o lantern didn't seem so funny. My heart was pounding so hard it made my chest hurt. I strained my ears in the silence that fell over the swamp. Jack, 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 the voice hissed, from somewhere to my left this time. The light blinked on, off, on. I counted ten heartbeats, this time before it went off. The voice sounded closer. I held very still my instincts screaming at me to hold my breath and not move until the menace had passed. The voice came again, far off to the right. Jack, Jack, Jack. It hissed. The light came on, off and on, off. It's moving away, I thought, relaxing just a bit, feeling safer. There was a long, long, long silence. Nothing stirred, not the wind in the grass, not the frogs or turtles in the water, not the crickets or night insects. Jack, Jack, Jack. The voice hissed softly right into my ear and I looked up into the glowing red eyes and twisted face of the jack-o'-lantern. I screamed and lashed out at it with my gun. I ran a few steps, tripped and fell over, knocking my head on the sharp stone. For a moment I saw stars and I felt blood pouring from my scalp, but the jack-o'-lantern was right behind me. 
I had to get away. I rolled and fell into a deep pool. I plunged underneath the water, flailing desperately against rope-like grasses that tried to keep me down. My head finally burst out of the water, and I gasped desperately for air, treading water as best as I could without my trembling limbs and aching head. I heard the creature laugh in the mist. <laughs> Jack, Jack, Jack. The voice hissed, delightly, and the light blinked on, off, on right over my head, blinding my dazed eyes as horror flowed through me and froze my limbs so I could no longer swim. For a long moment, the grotesque face and red eyes of the jack-o'-lantern loomed out, of the mist before my petrified gaze. My head started to swim with pain from my bleeding skull. The evil face above me, lit by its bright light, whirled around and around, growing dimmer as my eyes started to glaze. I was vaguely aware that I should keep swimming, keep trying to make my way to the edge of the pool. But the effort was too much for my suddenly heavy limbs. I barely noticed myself plunging down and down into the watery depths of the pool, too stunned by my injury to fight my way to the surface for a second time. Then there was only darkness and silence and a voice hissing in cold triumph. Jack. 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 Now, some true stories. Room 4 Fresh out of nursing school, I got my first real job in a fairly large hotel, in a department that I honestly never thought I would ever work in. It was a six-bed cardiac ICU with rooms that overlooked the city capitol building. It was a very, very nice unit, and I started out working 12-hour night shifts. The hospital I worked at had four other ICUs that were always full, so my unit always ended up being code bed, meaning if someone was arrested or went downhill fast, somewhere around the hospital, they came to us. I had been working there for a year, and I was no stranger to death. Each patient of mine who had died on my shift was usually already on their way out. Their families were by their side, the DNR order was signed, and the funeral home was already picked out. It was rarely ever a surprise. In fact, the only time I was ever needed to do CPR on my shift, it was not even in my department. So, I went on a nice long two-week vacation, got engaged, and had a beautiful tan. On my first night back, I received a report from the day charge nurse. She said she was off for a few days and suggested to remind the next charge nurse that the priest was coming in the morning to bless room four. I thought she was kidding at first, but she was serious. Apparently, while I was on vacation, every patient who was admitted to that room had died. But this came as no shock to me. People died often in our department, and it being a very religious institution, having a chaplain for almost every department, I just shook it off. Then she said that room four was empty and that it would serve as code bed for the night. Around 2 a.m., I got a call saying that they have someone to fill our open bed. The ICU downstairs was now going to code bed. So we were getting your run-of-the-mill chest pain, take a look in the morning kind of patient. Nothing to get excited about. We get the patient admitted and all settled in room four. He was a gentleman about 50 or so years old, very pleasant. His wife was with him and she looked dead on her feet. I got her some warm blankets and took her to our waiting room that had cot so she could get some rest. 
At around 3.30, I was watching monitors and the cameras in each room. All the patients were fast asleep. The cameras all cycled through about every three seconds, each one on one small TV we had on the desk. Room one was fine. Room two was fine. Room three was fine. Room four, there was someone in there. It cycled too quickly for me to get a good look, and the doors to the unit were locked. Maybe the other nurse let his wife back in? I walked down the hall and glanced inside. There was nobody. I shrugged it off. As it was late, I was tired. I was probably just seeing things. I went back to the desk and continued watching the screen. Room one, room two, room three, room four. I was not imagining anything. There was someone in room four. The person was standing in the corner by the window, their figure completely draped in shadow. I could not move my body. It cycled through again. This time, it was closer to the patient's bed, by maybe two or three feet. The hairs stood straight on my neck. The next time it cycled through, it was even closer. It stood in the light coming from the hallway, but despite the light, it was still shrouded in darkness. It cycled through again, and it was right next to the bed. My heart started pounding. I could barely speak to the nurse on the other end of the desk. As soon as my words formed and I was able to make some kind of noise to get her attention, the alarm on the monitor went off, signaling that the patient had cardiac arrested. The overhead system came on. A cart is needed in CCU room four. People poured into the department, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, they all rushed into the room, but I could not move. It cycled through the rooms again. Room four came up, and this time the lights were on, and there were 10 or 15 people surrounding the bed, doing CPR and slamming meds into his IV. Someone went to get his wife from the waiting room, but there it was in the opposite corner again, a dark figure watching this scene play out, just standing there. The man died of a heart attack. Room four was blessed that morning, right on schedule, and I put in my two week notice. It was near the end of high school. 2006-ish, fall in northern Wisconsin, perfect stomping around town weather. One Friday after school, I was over at my on and off high school boyfriend Jay's house playing video games or whatever. Around 7 p.m., we typically would meet up with our whole crew at a local restaurant, but we still had several hours to kill. We were getting bored. Miss those days. And it was so lovely out, so I suggested we go for a walk on the train tracks on the west side of town. The town has been built up so much since then, but at the time, there was only a fleet farm and a small burger joint near the tracks. And that was about it. Miles of woods on either side surrounded the tracks. As it was the perfect weather, and that doesn't last long in Wisconsin. I agreed. We jumped in his car and drove across town. We parked his little car to the side of the burger joint. At this point, it's late afternoon, you know, about dusk, sun about to set. We hop out of the car, walk about a block where the train tracks cross the street, hook a right down the tracks through the woods. That area didn't get as many trains going through as a different set of tracks in town, and there was also plenty of space to the left and to the right of the tracks, into the woods if a train did approach. It seemed safe. You could see maybe a mile in each direction if a train was coming, and to either side, just tall pines. We're walking down, balancing on the tracks, talking shit, jumping over stuff, whatever, for maybe five to ten minutes. Up ahead of us, we could see a few boxcars off to the side of the tracks. This feels creepy, but it was normal. 
As we approached them, we could see where two boxcars attached to each other, maybe about 10 to 20 feet, and then a single boxcar behind them. I got the heebie-jeebies as we approached the boxcars, but they were both shut. So as we peeked around on them, climbed up, etc., they were less menacing. Cool. We keep walking, sun is now down, and it's twilight. Quiet. We are both looking down as we pass the boxcars, balancing and such. We get past them, maybe another length of a boxcar, when I just have the sense to look up. And that's when I see it. I stop short. I swear the hair on my arm stood up, and suddenly I felt like a prey animal that had been spotted. Jay, what's that up there? There's something on the tracks. He stopped and looked up. What looked like maybe half a mile to a mile down the tracks, standing directly in the middle of them, was the shape of a person, or what I thought was. But, for how far away it is, the figure was unnaturally tall, standing stiff and still, arms at sides, with what looked like the shape of a bowler hat or something. I can still picture it. Now Jay doesn't fuck around with ghost stories and alien tales. He's a non-believer, but he saw it too. Uh, we need to go, he said. He grabbed my hand and spun me back into the direction we came from. We were walking very briskly, and if you have ever been on train tracks, you know it's all small rocks and pebbles, so it's a little rough. About a minute passed, my heart was pounding, and I looked back over my shoulder. This person, who was originally about a mile away, was so much closer. It's like he suddenly jumped half the distance between where he originally was to where we were. But still, the same sickeningly tall, featureless shadow with a hat, standing still, arms to sides, stood in the middle of the tracks. Jay! I actually screamed, making him whip his head around. I've never seen this guy scared. He grabbed my hand tighter and broke off into a sprint. Jay is about six foot and I'm five four, so his stride is a bit longer than mine. A couple years prior, I recovered from a fractured knee and femur, and it's common knowledge, I cannot run. If you've ever seen the cartoons with someone running and the other person is kind of flapping behind the runner, held by the hand, that's what I felt like. He took off. My legs moving, but my toes barely skimmed the tracks. We ran past the boxcars off to the side as we were about to get past the two that were hooked together. I stole one more frantic look over my shoulder. There he was. One box car away, same weird proportions like a dark opaque shadow. I swear my eyes bugged out of my head and my body and adrenaline said get the fuck out. I forced my legs down and pushed my own damn self into a run. We plowed forward, no more glances back, hooked back into the street and frantically fumbled our way back into his car slamming and locking the doors behind us. I remember both of us sitting there, panting, staring forward for a good minute or two until snapping back to it with a what in the actual fuck. The sun went down and nothing could be seen towards the track. We went to our hangout with a crew at seven, chomping at the bit to tell everyone what happened. No one believed us or cared, really. I told my dad later on, and he says so many people died building that railroad. It was probably a ghost. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. Fast forward to maybe 2011-ish. I'm in college. Jay and I break up and don't keep in touch. I get a text from him out of the blue. A link to that Slender Man game. I remember sitting in my dorm with a chill as I watched the preview and felt sick to my stomach. How he only moves towards you when you aren't looking 
and is frozen staring at you when you look back. Ugh. I read the Wikipedia page and creepypasta and all that bullshit. I know all of that stuff is made up, but the similarity to what we experience freaks me out. Present day. I looked up the chunk of railroad where we went down in my hometown on Google Maps. It's much more developed with shopping and housing around, but there is still a little stretch surrounded by trees, which is the one we walked down. I'm going back for Thanksgiving and was thinking about taking a jaunt to the tracks, but reading all of these spooky stories makes me change my mind. Just in case it is some entity, I don't want to take it back with me. It's the 80s. It's Halloween on a weekday, and I, being the oldest and a girl, am responsible for taking two younger brothers trick-or-treating, along with two young sons of my parents' friends. My parents and the kids' parents are at our house playing cards and smoking cigarettes. Having had a lot of babysitting responsibilities and chores that my younger brothers did not have, plus missing out on going trick-or-treating with friends, I was definitely bitter and ill-tempered throughout the evening. Because it's a school night, we're just doing the three blocks of my street and heading home. We make it down one side and back down the other, and are about three houses from home, when we get to the house of an elderly woman who lives alone and never gives out candy. But for the past couple of months, she's been renting the basement to some guy. I've seen him around a few times, and he either ignores me or yells at me for riding my bike on the sidewalk, though he did seem to be pleasant and say hello to my brothers. So the guy is on the sidewalk with another guy. There's a folding table set up, and there's a notebook on it. The men tell us that they don't have candy, but they are giving away prizes for anyone who goes through their haunted house. As they're explaining this, a few boys my age from my school show up and ask what the prizes are. They list pocket knives, baseball cards, and the grand prize is a BB gun. The men tell them they need to fill out their name, age, addresses, phone numbers, and when's a good time to contact parents to get permission for the prizes. The boys fill out their info very quickly, and honestly, at that point in my life, I was excited about all those prizes too. Basically, all the houses on our street were the same. I knew the layout of the basement, and I did not believe the haunted house could possibly be that scary. My brother and the other two little boys were also excited to do it. I filled out my own info along with my brothers, and were all about to head around back to enter the basement door. Then, one of the men says, Girls are not allowed. The boys from school immediately start laughing and lightly taunting me and are joined in by all four little kids. I feel my face get hot and a lump in my throat as they all walk away from me. I am embarrassed, humiliated, and seething with anger. The unfairness of it all, having to constantly be expected to babysit these brats, cook, clean, do laundry for zero dollars, and not even have a fun Halloween like a normal kid, and now I don't even get a chance to win anything. I want to flip the table over and destroy something. Then, I get the idea to take that notebook which has several pages of boys' contact info in it, and shove it into the sewer drain by the curb. If I can't win the prize, no one will. Just then, another group of about five boys from my boy-heavy street come by and ask what's up. Again, no parents present, cause it's the 80s. I take a deep breath and calmly as possible explain about the haunted house, prizes and writing their info in the notebook, which they all do right away. Here the group come around the side of the house laughing and bragging that they weren't scared. The men wait until they finish putting their info in the notebook and then start taking the new group back. They don't even notice I'm lagging behind. 
I grab that notebook and shove it into the sewer drain and get the heck out of there. The next day at school, it seems every boy in my class and maybe the whole school had done the haunted house, and each one thinks he will be the winner of some prize or another. I had a sense of satisfaction every time I hear them talk about it, because I know there will be no winners, as the notebook is gone, never to be found. To me, it feels like justice, and I tell no one for fear of getting into huge trouble. About a week later, still no winners, and kids have moved on and stopped talking about it. At around mid-morning, our teacher gets a call out to the hall to talk to someone for about five minutes and comes back looking wide-eyed and scared or something. Each boy in the class gets called to the office and does not return. As this is happening, the remaining kids have no idea what is happening until one boy, Scott, comes back and tells me everything. Apparently Jimmy, a kid in the other fifth grade class who was small for his age but the fastest runner in the whole school, was walking to school that morning and a guy tried to pull him into his car. Jimmy thrashed around wildly and kicked the guy several times as he was trying to pull him in. He eventually got away and ran as fast as he could down an alley and got to his grandmother's house because it was closer than school or his own house, and he knew she'd be home to help him. Jimmy recognized the guy who tried to kidnap him as the one who had the haunted house in the basement apartment. So, all the boys in the school are being individually called to the office and questioned by the police. During the questioning, each kid mentioned the notebook and so the police did not want any kids to be home alone, as most of us were after school because, in our neighborhood, typically both parents worked. The notebook basically gave the men a time frame of when kids would be home alone. When is a good time to contact your parent? Each kid filled out when a parent would be coming home from work, and the concern was that they'd have a guide of a good time to kidnap boys. When Scott told me this, I had an immediate sense of dread, and not because I was afraid boys would be taken from their homes while their parents were at work. I knew that could not happen because they didn't have the notebook, but I was truly afraid I would get in trouble for hiding it. Later, everyone found out that the police had gone to arrest the men, but they were not found. The apartment was searched, and there was no sign of the notebook but pictures were found. As a teenager, I was definitely told the pictures were graphic and included violent child pornography involving young boys. Our whole town was on high alert, and many of us latchkey kids came home to our first babysitter. Ours was a high school student named Sharon, who was the youngest of three girls in her family, and she was wonderful. I slowly got over the nagging fear that the notebook would be fished out of the sewer and my fingerprints identified, and I fully enjoyed my time with her. For once in my life, I was not a servant and second-class citizen to the boys in my house. She was kind to us all, but she made it clear that I was her favorite. I never got to go tumbling or gymnastics classes, because... We didn't have extra money for that, but the first thing Sharon did with us on the very first day was teach us all how to do cartwheels. My brother lost interest after that, but she went on to teach me front and back walkovers, back handsprings, and aerials and cartwheels with no hands. She painted my nails and French braided my hair. She would talk to me constantly, tell me about her teachers, her classes, friends, boyfriends, and listen intently to whatever grade, school, or family drama I had, asking questions or offering advice. She was exactly what I needed at that point in my life, and I secretly marveled at the series of events that brought her to us. She sat for us for close to two years. We got older, and she needed to move on as well. This was pre-internet, pre-Facebook, and sadly, I had lost touch with her. I knew that she had moved out west and had done some modeling as well. 
and some acting and was doing well. Then in my 20s, my mother called me in my apartment to tell me that Sharon had been brutally murdered in her home, stabbed over 30 times by a man she dated only a couple times who had been stalking her. I had been working late again, something I've grown used to over the past few months. Chicago never truly sleeps, and it was common to see people still moving around the streets, even as the clock ticked past midnight. My apartment was just a few blocks away, and I've made this walk home more times than I could count. The night was cool, the streetlights buzzing softly overhead as I made my way down the familiar route. There wasn't much traffic, which was typical for this time of night. The occasional car would pass, and sometimes I could hear the distant hum of the L train. I checked my phone out of habit, scrolling through notifications without really paying much attention to them. A message from a friend asking about plans for the weekend, a reminder about a bill due tomorrow. Just the usual. As I approached my building, I noticed Tom, my neighbor, outside by the garbage bins. He had a cigarette between his fingers, the glowing lighting up his face as he nodded in my direction. Burning the midnight oil again? He asked. Yeah, work's been busy lately, I replied, pausing for a moment before heading towards the door. What about you? I couldn't sleep, he said, shrugging. Figured I'd step out for a bit. I nodded, pushing the front door open. See you around. Take it easy, Tom replied before I disappeared inside. The elevator was sluggish, as usual, and I found myself staring at the scratched panel of buttons. I lived on the fourth floor, and as the elevator crept upwards, I glanced back at my phone. More notifications, more things to deal with tomorrow. When the elevator doors finally opened, I stepped into the quiet hallway. My apartment was at the far end, and I could see a faint light coming from under my door. I must have left the lamp on when I left earlier. Not unusual. I always forgot little things like that. But when I reached my door, something caught my attention. The door wasn't closed all the way. It was barely noticeable, just a fraction of an inch. But it was enough to make me stop. I didn't remember leaving it like that. I stood there for a moment, staring at the door, my hand hovering just above the knob. I reached for the door, but as I grasped the knob, I froze. The door was unlocked. I was sure I had locked it before leaving, as I always did. I stood there, staring at the knob, trying to make sense of it all. Maybe I had been in such a hurry earlier that I forgot. But no, I distinctly remember the click of the lock before I left. A knot tightened in my stomach as I pushed the door open. The apartment was quiet, everything seemingly in its place. The small lamp in the living room cast a soft glow illuminating the familiar surroundings. I stepped inside and locked the door behind me, twisting the lock back and forth as if to reassure myself that it was properly working. I walked into the living room, tossing my keys onto the counter. And that's when I saw it. Lying on the coffee table, where nothing had been earlier, was the photograph. My breath caught in my throat. I don't remember leaving it there. And more importantly, I didn't own any printed photos. I stepped closer, my heart thudding in my chest. The photo was of me taken earlier today on my walk from work. I recognized the street, the same one I had walked down just hours ago. My hand trembled as I picked it up, flipping it over to see if there was anything written on the back. There wasn't. Whoever took this photo had been watching me. They had followed me, and now they had been inside my apartment. I felt a rush of adrenaline, my mind racing with questions. How did they get in? Had I really left the door unlocked? I didn't think so. 
I quickly scanned the room again, looking for anything else that might have been moved. But everything seemed in place. I checked the windows, but they were locked too. Suddenly, my phone buzzed in my pocket, startling me. I pulled it out, half expecting to see a message from the stalker. But it was just Tom, my neighbor. Hey, you okay? You kind of looked a little off earlier, his message read. I stared at the screen, my thoughts too scattered to reply right away. Tom had been outside when I came home. Could he have noticed something? Should I tell him about the photo? I hesitated for a moment, staring at Tom's message. Should I tell him about the photo? Part of me wanted to confide in someone, but another felt like I needed to keep it to myself. At least for now. I didn't know what I was dealing with, and jumping to conclusions didn't feel right. After a long pause, I typed out a quick reply. Yeah, just a rough day at work. Thanks for checking in. I put my phone down, running my hands through my hair as I tried to steady my breathing. The photo still sat on the table, taunting me. My mind raced, thinking through all the possibilities. Who had taken it? Why leave it here? How did they get in? Trying to distract myself, I turned on the TV, hoping that some background noise would help calm my nerves. But I just couldn't focus. My thoughts kept clicking back to the unlocked door and the photo. It was almost like someone wanted me to know I was being watched. Someone who knew I'd come home tonight and find their little message. I stood up and walked around the apartment, checking the windows again, though I knew they were already locked. My eyes wandered over every corner of the room, looking for anything else out of place. Nothing. Just that photo. The buzz of my phone startled me again. Another message from Tom. If you need anything, let me know. I'm up for a while. I stared at the message, feeling really uneasy. Tom had always been friendly, but now it seemed like he was paying extra attention. I noticed it before, but maybe I had never looked for it. Was I overthinking things, or was it just a coincidence that he was always nearby, always checking in at the right time? I didn't respond to his message. Instead, I paced the room, glancing at the clock. It was past midnight now, and sleep felt impossible. My mind kept going over the day, trying to remember if I had seen anyone suspicious, anyone who might have followed me. Suddenly, a soft knock came at the door. The knock at the door sent a jolt through my body. I wasn't expecting anyone at this hour. I hesitated, my heart pounding in my chest as I tiptoed toward the peephole. It was Tom, standing there with his hand in his pockets, looking casual. For a brief second, I felt relieved. Then, I remembered the photo on the coffee table and the unlocked door. My nerves tightened again. I opened the door just a crack, trying to keep my voice steady. Hey, what's up? Tom smiled, though it didn't quite reach his eyes. Sorry to bother you. I thought I heard something strange, like someone messing with your door earlier. Just wanted to check in, make sure you're okay. I blinked, trying to process what he was saying. You heard someone? Yeah, probably just some drunk or something, but it didn't seem right. Tom continued, his eyes flicking past me into the apartment. Thought I'd make sure everything was cool. My hand gripped the edge of the door tighter. I wasn't sure what to make of this. Tom had always been friendly, but the timing of this concern felt off. And if he had really hurt someone... Why hadn't he called me or knocked on the door earlier? I'm fine, I said quickly, trying to close the door a bit more. Thanks for checking in. Tom's smile faltered just a bit. Okay, well, just let me know if you need anything. I nodded, forcing a smile before closing the door fully and locking it. As soon as I was alone again, 
I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. Something about the whole situation didn't sit right with me. I glanced back at the photo on the table, the reminder of someone having been inside, watching me. My phone buzzed again and I nearly jumped. Another message from Tom. Sorry if I freaked you out, just being a good neighbor. I stared at the message, feeling my skin crawl. He was being too attentive, too involved. It was hard not to connect with the dots. First the unlocked door, then the photo, and now Tom always seeming to be around at the perfect moment. I couldn't shake the feeling that he knew more than he was letting on. I decided I needed to talk to someone, so I called my friend Sarah. As the phone rang, I paced around the living room, my mind still racing. When she finally answered, her voice was groggy. Hey, uh, everything okay? She asked, clearly half asleep. I, I don't know, I admitted. Something weird's been happening. S someone was in my apartment earlier, I think. They left a photo of me on the table. There was a pause on the other end before Sarah spoke again. Uh, that's creepy. Did you call the police? I'm not sure what to tell them. A and I... I stopped mid-sentence, glancing at the coffee table again, where the photo still sat. It felt like it was staring back at me, an eerie reminder that someone had been close enough to take it. I don't even know what to say. What if they think I'm just overreacting? Sarah's voice grew more alert. You're not overreacting. Someone took a photo of you and left it in your apartment. That's serious. You need to call them. I bit my lip, considering it. Uh, maybe you're right, but it's just so bizarre. And, and Tom keeps checking on me. It's like he knows something, but... I don't know if I'm just being paranoid. Wait, Tom? Sarah asked, confused. Your neighbor? Yeah, I said, lowering my voice, even though I was alone. He's been around every time something weird happens. He texted me just after I found the photo, said he saw someone hanging around my door. It's almost like he's watching me. Uh, okay, that's weird. Do you think he could be involved? I don't know, I admitted, glancing nervously at the front door. He's always been friendly, but now it feels off. I don't know what to think. Sarah sighed. <sighs> um, look, I really think you should call the police, even if it's nothing. Better safe than sorry, and maybe keep your distance from Tom for a bit, just in case. I nodded, even though she couldn't see me. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Thank you so much, Sarah. Stay safe, okay? She said, her voice a little softer now. Call me if you need anything. After hanging up with Sarah, I sat in silence for a long moment. But she was right. It was better to be safe than sorry. I dialed the non-emergency number, feeling a wave of anxiety wash over me. As I waited for them to pick up, when I finally spoke, my voice sounded smaller than I intended. I'd like to report something suspicious, I said, trying to keep my tone steady. I think someone's been watching me, and maybe him and then inside my apartment. The dispatcher took down my information, asking for the details of what had happened with the photo and the sounds outside my door. I tried my best to explain, though it felt surreal, even as the words left my mouth. By the time the call ended, they reassured me that an officer would be dispatched to check things out. It wasn't long before I heard a knock at the door. My heart jumped, but when I checked the peephole, I saw the distinct navy blue uniforms of two police officers standing just outside. Taking a deep breath, I opened the door and let them inside. One of the officers, a tall man with tired eyes, introduced himself. Ma'am? We're here to follow up on your report. Mind if I ask you a few questions? I nodded, still feeling uneasy despite their presence. I led them into the living room, where they asked me to go over the events again in more detail. 
As I described the photo, the unlocked door, and the eerie feeling I was being followed, the officer took notes, his partner occasionally glancing around the apartment. Have you noticed anyone suspicious hanging around recently? The officer said. I hesitated. There's my neighbor Tom. He's been really helpful, but... I don't know. It's just a feeling. He's always around checking on me, and it seems a little too convenient. The officer nodded, his expression unreadable. We'll talk to him, just to cover all the bases. After I finished explaining everything, they went down the hall to speak with Tom. I stayed inside, pacing nervously, listening to the muffled conversation through the door. It wasn't long before the officers returned. Your neighbor says he hasn't noticed anything unusual, but he's concerned for your safety, the officer said, his voice calm. He offered to keep an eye out for anything strange. I nodded, not sure if that made me feel better or worse. Look, we don't have enough of a full investigation right now, the officer continued, but we'll keep a patrol car just outside tonight just in case. You should try to get some rest. I thank them, feeling a slight sense of relief at the idea of police nearby. Maybe now, with someone watching over the apartment, I could finally get some rest. I couldn't sleep. The events of the night replayed in my mind, the unsettling photos, the noises outside my door and Tom's messages. The fear settled in deep, keeping me alert despite the police being outside. I stayed up all night, jumping at every creak in the apartment, every distant sound from the street. The small knife I had tucked into my bag for protection felt like my only source of comfort as dawn finally broke. The next day passed in a haze of routine, but the weight of the previous night's fear lingered at the back of my mind. I went through my workday mechanically, my body tired but my thoughts racing. By the time I finished my shift, the sky had already darkened, and I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. As I made my way home, I decided to stop by the convenience store a few blocks from my apartment. I needed something to help me unwind, maybe a snack and a drink to go along with a movie I planned to watch. The store was brightly lit, a small beacon of normalcy amidst the growing shadows of the evening. I walked inside, the sound of the automatic doors hissed as they slid closed. Grabbing a soda and a bag of chips, I wandered towards the counter, trying to shake the nerves that still clung to me. The cold night air felt sharp against my skin as I left the convenience store clutching the plastic bag of snacks. Ever since I found those photos in my apartment, my nerves have been on edge. I kept one hand near the pocket in my jacket as I walked quickly through the dimly lit parking lot. Something didn't feel right, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The parking lot, too, felt unnervingly still, the flickering streetlights casting long, distorted shadows over the scattered cars. The silence pressed in around me, broken only by the faint hum of the lights overhead. I quickened my pace, the sound of my own footsteps loud and uneven. My breath hitched, and I glanced back, expecting to see someone behind me. But there was no one. My heart pounded harder, every instinct screaming at me to move faster. The shadows felt like they were closing in, stretching farther across the pavement as I hurried towards the far end of the lot. I tried to tell myself it was just paranoia, just the leftover fear from the night before. Then, everything went dark. A bag was yanked over my head with brutal force and strong arms wrapped around my throat, squeezing tight. Panic surged through me as I thrashed wildly, trying to scream, but the sound was muffled by the bag. My voice trapped inside. My lungs burned desperately for air, but each breath came in shallow, choking gasps. The grip around my throat tightened and my vision started to blur. My legs kicked out violently, but I couldn't break free. Every muscle in my body screamed for oxygen, 
for a way out, but the world around me was fading, slipping into darkness. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. My hand fumbled toward my pocket, feeling the cold still of the night. With the last ounce of strength I had left, I yanked it free and swung blindly behind me. I felt the blade hit flesh, and a low grunt of pain followed. The grip on my throat loosened just enough for me to rip the bag from my head. I gasped for air, stumbling forward, vision swimming as I tried to regain my balance. My entire body trembled with fear and adrenaline, but I forced myself to turn around. He stood there, hunched over, clutching his side where I had just slashed him. Blood poured between his fingers, staining the pavement beneath him. But his eyes, his eyes were locked on with a burning hatred. Who are you? I rasped, my voice shaking, barely able to speak. His twisted grin sent a shiver down my spine. You don't remember me? He said, his voice low, full of contempt. <laughs> of course you don't. I stared at him, struggling to place his face. There was something familiar about him, but it was like grasping at a half-forgotten memory. You think you're so much better than me, he hissed taking a shaky step toward despite the wound. You never even looked at me back then. You laughed like I didn't matter. My memory hit like a cold wave. High school. He had been there, always lurking in the background. Quiet, unassuming. Someone I had barely noticed. I swallowed hard, dread settling deep in my chest. You, I whispered, feeling a rising sense of horror. I barely remember you. You rejected me, like I was nothing. He took another step, his breath ragged. <sighs> but I swore you'd pay for it one day. My pulse raced as his words sank in. This wasn't just some random attack. He had planned this. He had been waiting for this moment, fueled by a hatred I hadn't even known existed. I didn't want your love, he said, his voice trembling with anger. I wanted you to feel what it's like to be nothing, to feel hunted, to feel powerless. I backed away, my heart pounding against my chest. I, I don't understand, I said my voice barely above a whisper. That was years ago. His face contorted with rage. You thought you could laugh at me and walk away, but I've been waiting. I've been waiting all this time to make you suffer. His legs gave out and he collapsed to the ground, blood pooling beneath him as his breath came in shallow gasps. I stood there, paralyzed, watching him struggle to breathe, trying to comprehend this nightmare that had unfolded right in front of me. A boy I barely remembered from my past had plotted his revenge for years, and now he had come for me. Then, I heard it. The soft chime of a text message. My pulse quickened as I looked down at his limp body. His phone must have gone off. My hands shook as I crouched down, reaching towards his jacket pocket. For a moment, I hesitated, but then forced my hand inside. I pulled out his phone, the screen still glowing with a new notification. The message read, Did you get the job done? I opened the conversation, and what I saw made my blood freeze. There were photos of me, walking to work, leaving my apartment, moving through my daily life. He had been watching me for weeks, maybe longer. Each photo was sent to him with a chilling, calculated precision. My breath came in short, panicked gasps as I scrolled up further. The stalker had been communicating with someone, someone who had been helping him all along. My blood ran cold as I read through the exchange. 
Make sure she finds the pictures. Tonight's the night. I'm going to finish this. Then came the reply from earlier that night. I don't care what you do, as long as I get paid. With growing terror, I pulled out my own phone and compared the unknown number to my contacts. My hands shook violently as I scrolled through my list praying I was wrong. But when I saw the match, my heart plummeted. It was Tom. A wave of nausea hit me as the realization set in. Tom, the friendly neighbor who has always been so concerned, so helpful, had been involved from the beginning. He had been feeding information to my stalker, planting the photos, manipulating me. All for money. I felt numb as I dialed the police. My voice shaking as I tried to explain everything. Tom had betrayed me in the worst possible way, and I had never even suspected him. It didn't take long. A knock at Tom's door echoed through the hallway, louder than I've ever heard before. I stepped out into the corridor, standing in the shadows as the police spoke to him. I held my breath as I watched the scene unfold. Tom opened the door, calm as ever, his face the picture of confusion. Uh, what's going on? He said, his voice dripping with faux innocence. They moved swiftly, stepped inside. Within moments, Tom was in handcuffs, his calm facade cracking ever so slightly. His eyes locked onto mine just for a second as they led him past me down the hallway. You were always easy to fool, he said, his voice low, cold, and with a grim smirk on his face. How could I have been so blind? He had been right there, pretending to care, pulling the strings the entire time. As I sat in my apartment alone and shaken, I realized how close I had come to losing everything. Not just my life, but my sense of trust. I thought I had known who the real danger was, but the truth had been right in front of me the whole time, hidden by a neighbor's smile. The Grinning Man Detroit has a bad rap when it comes to crime, violence, and drugs. But nothing is worse than having an arsonist plaguing the streets, destroying homes and neighborhoods with a single match. In 2006, an arsonist managed to destroy a library, a school, an apartment complex, and a nursing home within an eight-week period. The police were using every resource available to locate the sick firebug, but they never found any clues or suspects in the devastating crimes. Two months after the last fire, there was a 911 call that made the news, as the call claimed that the arsonist in question was about to strike, and sure enough, he did. In the call, you can hear the panicked screams as the residents of yet another apartment complex fled for their lives and tried desperately to put out the flames. But... The most startling moment came when the caller began crying out in pain as he had become trapped in the burning building, the flames scorching his entire body. No one knew what became of the mystery caller, and it was believed that he had perished in the fire. The building was burnt to the ground, leaving almost a hundred people homeless. A small memorial was constructed at the ruins on the building in honor of the unknown man who called 911 and saved many lives. The police knew that arsonists loved to return to the scene of their crimes to admire their work and the destruction. Setting up a few surveillance cameras at the memorial, the police mistakenly awaited any suspicious individuals who might stop by. It only took them about three weeks to finally locate a suspect. In the footage, the camera, a tall man wearing a black hoodie and a bandana with a skeletal depiction of the human lower jaw over his mouth, approached the memorial and just stared at the charred ruins of the apartment building. 
He stared for hours, barely moving and never turning his gaze. When another person began approaching the memorial, he suddenly turned away and walked down the sidewalk out of sight. The man returned night after night for almost a week. Each time he did the same thing, stared at the ruins and all, and shied away from anyone who approached, except on the seventh night. A woman was walking her dog and passed by the man. He turned and smiled at her and frightened her to no end. She reported the strange man to the police, claiming that he was grinning wickedly and smelled of gasoline and smoke. Two nights later, another building was torched by the arsonist. An abandoned warehouse, which still had surveillance cameras running. The same man from the memorial appeared at the scene wearing the same hoodie and bandana. Witnesses to the fire claimed to have seen a man running from the warehouse wearing a dark hoodie and the weird thing was he seemed to be smiling. A twisted, almost impossible huge grin on his face. The police were able to pick up a trail using scent tracking hounds. The dogs led the police to a small run-down house on the outskirts of the city. Inside was the lone occupant wearing the same hoodie. Aside from the arsonist, there were gallons of gasoline, butane, matches, lighters, and a newspaper clipping talking about the series of arsonist fires. When the police cornered the man and ordered him on the ground, they were horrified by the man's face. He had been wearing a bandana, his actual jaw been exposed, leaving him with a perpetual grin burned onto his face. The man had been the one who called 911 and seemingly died in the blaze. He had been horrifically burned but survived. His face nothing more than a monument to the sickness that is arson. The man laughed a little and looked at the police as he shrugged to speak, his lipless grin mocking everyone who dared to look at him. It's about time you found me, he arrogantly replied with a hoarse raspy voice. I was going to give you guys another call, but what's the fun in that? The grating man was arrested and died from a severe infection before he could stand trial. Even though he's gone, his actions and crimes will forever haunt the city, leaving scars that will never heal. For hours it stared. For me, life was a whirlwind of lights and smoke, music and men. I lived in a beaten up shanty close to North Edsa, crammed in a closet-like room with a bunch of other women. We slept on mats on the dirt floor and shared the space with mange-infested dogs, flea-bitten cats and cockroaches. My wardrobe consisted mostly of skimpy skirts, tank tops and the cheapest high heels you can buy. After a hard night at the bars of dancing and exposing myself, sometimes spending time in the back room with a heavily drunk man and my eyes like a dead fish staring at the ceiling, I earned enough cash to go to the thrift shop. The weather in Manila had become chilly at night and I needed a sweater. I took a walk down a few streets that smelled of garbage and human urine mixed with the smog of jeepneys, tricycles, and trucks that never ended. It wasn't long before I found the street lined with a second-handed clothes, undoubtedly from American charities, but somehow grabbed my greedy merchants looking to make extra pesos. The sweater was like a pearl in murky waters as it lay neatly on top of a bunch of tattered, motley clothes. Wondering how someone had not bought it yet, I quickly took it in my hands and studied the richness of the fabric. It was as soft as a rabbit's fur and just as warm. Across its front was a large pouch where you could put your hands and do for warmth. And that's where I found the note on a crumpled piece of yellow paper. It smelled like the section of a library with ancient books could be found. Dust and dank. On the paper were the scrawled words. Where? 67th Bonwy Street. Pay 
1,000 pesos a night. Job, lie on the bed from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. Keep your eyes shut. Never open them. Past three, your money will be on the dresser. Bonawi Street. The note did not say which city, but I recall the name of the street in Quezon. That one of my roommates used to visit for a client. It was where the more upper class people lived. I stuffed the note in my pocket and paid the merchant. Only 30 pesos. Not bad. The sweater was wonderful on my skin and made me glow like a snowflake. I felt like one of those young starlets on our local TV network. And in my pocket was the promise of an easy paying high job. This came so rarely, I must admit that. So, if the job seemed sketchy, the promise of a thousand pesos a night was tempting. I could get myself out of my situation, maybe go to college, find a real job. After a lot of asking and searching, I found the house that night. 67th Bonawi Street was in desolate condition, even if it was in an upper-class neighborhood. A single-story house surrounded by a short wire fence. Yard unkempt, weeds sticking up like tasseled hair. Boards molded, loose shingles chipped, paint faded. Windows cloaked with dust. Still, it was a hundred times better than the shanty I slept in. The light of the patio was on as I approached, and when I knocked, the door opened as if left ajar. I said hello. No answer. The interior smelled aged and sour, like wet laundry left in the wash for days. I stepped inside, leaving the door slightly open so the light from the patio can illuminate my way. The floor felt as if it might give way beneath my weight. I felt the walls pressing in on me, heavy and damp. The place reminded me of the body they found in the sewage canal close to where I lived, bloated and bruised, deteriorated. I passed the dark living room. There was a TV, a battered couch, a coffee table with an ashtray and some empty cans. The room reeked of cat urine and dried feces. No one there. I attempted to turn on some light switches, but found them useless. I turned away and headed down a hallway, noticing a pale light glowing underneath a closed door. I called again. Absolute silence. I clasped the handle and pushed, ignoring the greasy residue it left on my palm. I found a single bed covered in drab sheets, one dresser beside it with a digital clock. It illuminated the time strongly through the darkness. 10.50 p.m. Feeling disturbed, I might have turned away. The house was empty. I admit, I thought the job was just going to be another man looking for a quick fix. But now I was curious. It didn't seem that way, and the uncertainty of it unnerved me. But still, 1,000 pesos was too good to pass. I needed to find out if it was true. I lay on the bed with the note in my hands facing the glow of the clock. 10.54 I listened. The house made no sound, muffled as if a hand lay over it. I felt afraid, but excited. 10.56 My heart throbbed from my chest, through my throat, in my head. I imagined the ticking of a clock, trying to match my heartbeat with its beat. 10.59 I shut my eyes, waited. 11 came. I knew with my eyes closed because the change in the atmosphere was immediate. I was not alone. My eyes were shut, yet I felt it. So close to my face. The minute hairs on my forehead tingled, it breathed. Tight, stressed, as if forced to breathe only from its nostrils. I felt the air warm, the area just above my lips. I smelled it. A sour smell like pickled gums, and there was something else. Pungent, thick sweat. The sweat of blood. I resisted the urge to gag. Seconds turned to minutes, and still the presence lingered against my face. My body suffered, paralyzed with fear. 
I felt every strained breath. In. Out. Slow. Afraid. I felt the slightest itch on my body. Prickles against my legs. Bites up my thighs. Behind my head and neck. Sweat. Creeping, crawling, brushing, upturning hairs and begging me to scratch and move. I didn't. Bones ached, muscles wept, my heart, my heart struggled like a sparrow caught in someone's hands. The presence continued its steady closeness of my face. My forehead glittered with sweat and now began to throb. My nose prickled, twitched. I wondered if it saw that. Even my eyelids sweated. My eyes behind them stiff, shot scared. Behind them, lids like frightened children in a closet. The smell relented. My lungs resisted its entry, asking for me to turn my head away, escape from such a foul smell. Yet, I could not. Every part of my body was frozen as long as the thing stared into my face. But I never opened them. My hand still clutched the note. As long as I kept my eyes closed, I thought, nothing could happen to me. I analyzed the letter in my mind, repeated those three words, never open them. Again, ten times. Unaccountable times, stealing myself to start my next move. I breathed. A long inhale, Sourness and the sickly smell of blood swamped my lungs. I gagged, coughed, and then I turned. I turned away into the bed, curled myself, fetal-like, eyes clamped shut like vices. And when I relaxed, I felt it. Still there, a hair's width away from my face. It was hovering, floating. How could this thing have moved with me? I did not feel any weight on the bed during the transition, any sign to suggest that it had crawled over me, moved beside me, refocused itself against my face. I allowed a few minutes to pass before I tried again. I moved, slowly, deliberately, sensing it against my face, and it moved with mine, smoothly, soundlessly until I was completely on my back. My face, eyes shut, staring straight up. The thing looking down upon me, relentlessly, grimaced, knit my brows, sweated. I wanted to bat at it, but I could not. I was too afraid. All I could clutch onto was the promise that this could end. I waited, ate, sweated, prayed. It stayed with me, almost there. I could not sleep. 3 a.m., the digital clock alarmed, and just like that, I was released. The thing that had looked on at my face for four long hours was gone. I did not immediately open my eyes. I waited until the sweat on my brow became cold and dry. I listened to my body unlock. One by one, like a warden walking across a prison, releasing the prisoners cell by cell. I could breathe again. My heart pumped, bold and strong. I felt my fingers, the warmth of my skin. I yearned to stretch and let life sizzle through every part of me. I opened my eyes. One thousand pesos lay on the dresser. One thousand pesos for the horror I had endured. I took it and did not look back as I left. A week had passed since the night I spent there. Although my money was gone now, spent over things I couldn't even remember, the memories from that night had not. Not a moment went by I wasn't thinking of the thing that had breathed so close to my face. Could I have been imagining it? Perhaps my fears had been so strong, my mind had created something to justify it. But my senses could not have been tricking me. I smelled it. Blood and sour rank. I felt it. Warm breath on my face. Who had left the money? Who was the presence I felt? And 
the question that caused me the most dread. What would have happened if I had opened my eyes? My return to the house was no longer just for money, but answers. The evening I returned, I noticed that nothing had changed. The only difference from the first time I had been there were the bed sheets, still crumpled from my use. The effervescent light from the clock was resolute, like a statue's stern gaze, almost punishing as I lay on the bed. Just a few seconds before 11 p.m., I shut my eyes. The thing appeared close to my face exactly on the second. This time, my fear was replaced by a studious curiosity. I noticed that right before it arrived, I did not sense anyone walk into the room. Its appearance was fluid, soundless, as if it had materialized from thin air. The thick smell of blood and sourness were consistent with the first time. I turned my head slowly left and right, and every movement was mirrored perfectly by it. Like studying yourself in a mirror, your reflection so close to your face you could fog it with your breath from your nostrils. I dared to do the one thing I had not the last night I was here. I brought my hands to my face, cautiously, feeling my bones creak beneath the tense muscles and cold skin, the sweat building on my frightened palm and fingers. As my hands reached close, they stopped, protested, hesitated. My heart banged like wild mice in a cage. I grimaced, summoning all of my courage, eyes sweating behind the lids. My hands moved again. The unseen presence continued its breathing, steady, undaunted, unmoving. My fingers touched something. I stopped. Every part of my body froze. I could not breathe. The blood on my face swelled as I choked on fear. The breathing from the thing changed. It grew raspy, excited. Its putrid breath hit my face more powerfully. I could not tell my fingers to move. They stayed where they were, paralyzed, touching it. The length of time that passed after, I could not recall. My mind too swamped in fear. All I could recall was, at last, the lockdown of my mind had subsided enough for my fingers to try and comprehend what it was touching. Hair, sticky and cold. My heart banged. My fingers moved, slightly. I felt the firmness of a scalp beneath the air. The thing continued to breathe as if enthused. Somehow I had managed to detach myself from the paralyzing terror of my body and now I was moving my fingers like a puppeteer would to his marionette. They followed the curve of the scalp, lowered until I felt skin. The skin felt torn and jagged. The sticky fluid was thicker there. My fingers passed the broken skin, and now I was palpitating. What felt like flesh? The flesh of chopped beef parts in the market, sticky and soft. I lowered my hands, my hands thumped so hard, I thought I might die of heart failure. I was too scared to continue the investigation. It felt like, like I had been touching a severed head. 3 a.m. Again, I waited until I was relaxed enough before opening my eyes. Like before, 1,000 pesos lay neatly on the dresser. My hands, still paralyzed for what they had felt earlier, were clean. I thought they might have been soaked in blood, but there was nothing. I ran from the house, terrified. Perhaps a ghost was haunting the building, and I promised never to return, no matter how much I needed the money. But that was a month ago. My roommates and I had taken a turn for the worse. Town officials were cracking down on businesses like the one we were working at, and required to show proof that we were tested just to make sure we weren't spreading any diseases. But lab tests required money. The bar managers I worked for were snapping up only the girls who could give him the negative tests quickly, and space was limited. In spite of the fears I felt, the promises I had made to never return, the need for money was great. After all, 
I had nothing bad ever happen to me while I was there. 11 p.m. The demonic presence returned. I grimaced my eyes tight, determined not to let it scare me. I told myself the job was easy. Keep my eyes closed from 11 to 3 and I will be paid. Handsomely. I suppose I had gotten used to the presence for only a few hours into the night. I found myself fighting the urge to sleep. The rhythm of its breathing lulled me. In. Out. In. Out. Its sour breath mixed with the sickly smell of blood, perfuming me to sleep. I tried hard to fight it. I failed, and soon sleep's heavy hand had successfully pressed down on my weary mind. The girl in my dream was pretty. Slim body, short, hair long and straight, as dark as the skies in the province. Eyes deep and shadowy. She watched as I slept, so close to my face. I could place a hand to her cheek and ask why she was there. Leave, she whispered. Leave. Her face grew distorted, and then she started making choking, gagging sounds. I sat up in horror and watched as her skin turned to a ghastly blue. Her skin bulged and turned red. She was trying to scream, say something, but all I could hear were the hoarse, ragged breathing sounds that watched me. Watched me as I... And I was awake. By some miraculous reason, I had not opened my eyes. But the room was filled with the same choking, gasping noises I had heard in my dream. The floor shook as if there were some violent commotion happening in the room with me. And then, silence. Only my beating heart banged in my ears. Still, I did not open my eyes. Not now. Not until I could hear the alarm so I can safely take the money and leave. But it did not end there. The next sound I heard sickened me more than anything I had ever experienced. A rhythmic, moist sound, like someone carving flesh with a saw, and then dripping. A thump as something heavy hit the floor. I heard footsteps, heavy and slow, heading my way, every inch of my body screaming to open your eyes. Run! I was shaking. Sweating, so fear-stricken like a bellowing animal held upside down before its throat was slit. The footsteps kept coming. Breathe, breathe. I couldn't. I needed to run, but I couldn't. I was afraid. I'd lasted for too long keeping my eyes closed. I couldn't open them, no matter how insane it sounded. The footsteps stopped right next to the bed I lay on. The thing was once more pressed close to my face, breathing, gasping. It felt like my muscles would snap under the tension. My fear was like a thousand knives angled towards my body. The slightest move threatening to kill me. Minutes stretched on, slowly, cruelly. I wanted out, out of everything. The room, the need for money. The nights with strangers and terror of it all. Call girl. I want it out. 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 And then, a blessing like the sun after a typhoon. The sound of the alarm clock. 3 a.m. I opened my eyes and found myself in an empty room. There was nothing there. Nothing on the floor where I had heard someone screaming and their body being carved. The money on the dresser. But it didn't matter. I didn't even grab it. I fled out of the house like a beaten dog. I could not sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I sought out some answers to the house I had been visiting. The town captain believed my story that I was sent by a wealthy family to find out if the house was for sale and check if there was any history behind it. Years ago, a wealthy man once lived there. He was quiet and kept to himself, seemed to cause no harm to anyone. Every once in a while, he took in a call girl to keep him company for the night. But many men 
did the same. Not much to be suspicious about until the neighbors smelled something foul coming from his house. They found him in his room with the headless body of a girl on the floor. Who knows how long he had been there with the body. Maybe days. He was standing still like an upright coffin. And in his outstretched hand was the girl's head. He wouldn't put it down. Just held it out so steady and still. His expression dead. They shot him right there. The captain opened a drawer and drew out a file. This is a photo of the girl they believed was killed. She was an orphan, only 16. Probably did what she did for the money. The other girls who worked with her said she had been with a man two other times. It was on the third night when he killed her. Here, take it. She was the same girl from my dream, but what chilled me more was the sweater she wore in the photo. White and soft. The same one I had found in the second-hand store with the note in the pocket. I think the captain barely able to let out the words. When I returned to my shanty later that day, I discovered that the white sweater had disappeared from my closet, and so did the note. When I asked my roommates if they had seen or taken it, all I got was the answer no. I gave up working as a call girl and found a job as a career for an elderly couple. Although the work was hard and slow, I persisted and saved up enough money to start college. Sometimes I passed by the thrift store where I had found the white sweater with the cursed note. I remembered the three nights I had spent with the dark presence and how insane I had been. Even returning the favor after so much fear. For money. For curiosity. That's what a call girl's life did to you. You become jaded to the dangers you repeatedly put yourself into. Sleeping with strangers, potential murderers, returning for the money and thrill of it all. I tried to stuff the memories into the dark cracks of my mind. Forget it. But still I wondered. What if I had opened my eyes? A few years later, I came upon an article in the news. A small one amongst a few other murders. They always wrote these stories with such detail and my blood curled. A body of a call girl had been found. Her head had been severed. The girl's eyes were wide open. Dolls in the Attic I was part of a cleanup crew when the city decided to tear down an old building that had asbestos in the walls. The building I was assigned to was a toy store for at least 50 years. So, it was indeed a sad affair. Once on site, I felt an unsettling vibe that was like a mixture of nostalgia and forgotten memories. There was something else in the mix which I could not put my finger on. Needless to say, it was creepy. I heard a lot of haunted stories, and until then, I never paid much attention to them. I was soon to be proven wrong. There were seven of us in the crew after suiting up. We set off in our designated areas. Mine was the attic. I wasn't that impressed with my assignment, so I began to pull my equipment up the stairs and prepared to work. When I first entered the space, I had to fight many cobwebs and a bunch of boxes, crates, and cabinets. The prep crew had neglected to clear it all out, so I started to move and pack all the items. I tried to ignore the freaky giggles and sniggers thinking that the laughter was either coming from downstairs or from the toys in the boxes, I soldered on. It wasn't until a doll's arms fell on the floor, right in front of me, that I began to feel I wasn't alone. I felt like it hadn't been thrown, but rather it had been dropped from above. I looked up and there was no way it fell. There were only beams and roofing slats, 
nothing that the arm could have fallen from. It was confusing. As I picked up the arm and tossed it in the box, I heard a deep growl from somewhere in the back of the attic. I spun around and saw that something had disturbed the thick dust which billowed up into a big cloud. I yelled, Who is there? Silence first, then a cackle like an evil witch. I slowly crept back towards the back. I stopped when I saw a dirty old doll with matted red hair standing against the chest of drawers. The eyes were closed. At that point, I was losing my temper, even though I was still feeling uneasy. I stomped forward and snatched the doll up. Haunted houses are one thing, but haunted dolls? I had already decided to toss the doll out, but nearly fainted when the eyes suddenly flew open. Then they rolled back. I dropped the doll in shock, and then a moldy old monkey started thrashing its cymbals. Childish giggling ensued. I was so angry, so I kicked the doll and threw the monkey in the trash. But then, a small ball came bouncing towards me. I kicked that too, and felt like a frightened child having a tantrum. It was bizarre, but very powerful. Feeling like something was trying to come over me. Like a possession or something. I heard more evil laughter. Now I was terrified and screaming. Stop! Stop it! It's not funny! Then a box fell off the dresser, and I started hearing whispers. To hell with that. I ran out and resigned on the spot. I don't care what anyone says. You can't pay me enough to deal with that kind of thing. The Witch of Black Hollow In the remote forests of New England, far, far from the comfort of paved roads and towns, there is a place that no local will dare to speak of. Known to few as Black Hollow, it's a stretch of dense woodland where even animals seem to avoid venturing. Over the years, rumors have circulated about strange happenings, children disappearing without a trace, eerie lights flickering between the trees, and unsettling sounds that echo in the dead of night. Though dismissed by most as folklore, historical records tell a different story, one that many have tried to bury. The origins of the legend date back to the 1600s, during the height of the witch trials. A woman by the name of Agnes Colburn lived deep in the woods, one of the outskirts of Puritan Village. She was an outsider, a healer, and to many, a woman of unholy knowledge. The villagers grew wary of her strange ways, her solitary life, her herbal potions, and the odd symbols she'd carve into trees. When children from the village began disappearing, the whispers about Agnes grew louder. According to surviving documents, one particularly harsh winter, three children vanished within a week. Each had been seen playing near the woods, but never returned. Desperate, the villagers formed search parties, combing the forest in vain. Then, one night, a hunter claimed to have seen Agnes near the edge of the village, dragging something small and limp behind her into the darkness. The next morning, she was accused of witchcraft. The trial was swift. Agnes denied the charges, but refused to speak of the missing children. The villagers convinced her of guilt, took matters into their own hands. They dragged her to the hollow and hanged her from an ancient tree at its heart. Before she died, legend says she cursed the village, vowing to return and take what was hers. The next night, the remaining children vanished. For generations, the story of Agnes Colburn faded into obscurity, told only in hushed tones as a warning to keep children away from the woods. But there are those who believe her curse was not just a myth. In the 1940s, two children's siblings named 
Thomas and Abigail disappeared while playing near the edge of Black Hollow. The town, now a small and forgotten settlement, conducted an extensive search. The children's mother, Anna, was beside herself with grief. Neighbors claimed she wandered into the woods every night, calling for her children, but always returned empty-handed. Three days later, a farmer named George Morrow, who lived on the edge of the hollow, reported hearing something disturbing. He had heard soft laughter coming from the woods late at night, and when he went to investigate, he found small footprints in the mud leading deeper into the forest. Morrow, terrified, told authorities, but his warnings went unheeded. A week after the disappearance, Anna was found dead, hanging from the same ancient tree where Agnes Colburn had been executed. Her face was twisted in terror, her eyes wide and staring at the forest. There were no signs of the children, and her home was found in disarray, as she had been frantically searching for something in her final hours. What terrified investigators most was a series of symbols, identical to the ones Agnes had carved centuries before, scratched into the walls of her children's room. In the years that followed, Black Hollow's reputation grew darker. No new families moved into the area, and those who remained kept their children close, especially after dark. Yet the disappearances continued. Every few decades, a child would vanish, almost without a trace. And a few who claimed to have seen something would speak of a pale figure standing just at the edge of the woods, watching. In 1986, local historian Margaret Weaver, driven by an obsession with uncovering the truth behind the legend, began researching the history of Black Hollow. She combed through ancient trial records, personal letters, and town archives, trying to piece together the strange events surrounding the Colburn case and the subsequent disappearances. Weaver's final report, published in a small regional journal, detailed a chilling pattern. Each time a child went missing, the surrounding woods would grow unnaturally still, and the air would carry a strange, sweet smell like rotting fruit. Most disturbingly, she noted that many of the families whose children disappeared had ancestral ties to the original villagers who had condemned Agnes. Weaver's research ended abruptly when she too vanished while visiting Black Hollow late one autumn evening. Her car was found at the forest's edge, key still in the ignition, and her notes scattered on the ground. The only clue was a single footprint in the mud, much too small to be hers, leading into the hollow. To this day, Black Hollow remains a place of fear. Locals, when pressed, admit that no child has ever been found once they disappear, though some claim to have heard distant laughter or seen fleeing shadows in the forest. They speak of a woman, pale and thin, her eyes gleaming with something otherworldly, standing along the trees at dusk. She is always watching. She is always waiting. The authorities, of course, deny these reports. But those who have lived near the hollow their entire lives know the truth. The witch of Black Hollow still walks the woods her hunger never sated, and her curse still claiming the descendants of those who wronged her. And if you listen carefully on certain nights, you can hear her calling for her children, forever lost in the darkness of the hollow. And now on to our four-part story entitled, I'm Being Stalked by Someone from a Genealogy Website. Part 1 I decided to get into genealogy when the rest of my family did. It started with my mother. She had always been curious about her origins, being adopted and never knowing much about her biological parents. 
One day, she bought herself a DNA test kit, hoping to find family ties we didn't know existed. I remember watching her as she carefully packed away the sample, excitement bubbling under her usual calm exterior. For her, this was more than just a hobby. It was about answering questions she'd carried with her her whole life. When the results came back, they gave her something she hadn't known she was missing. A sense of comfort, of belonging. She'd always been grateful for her adoptive parents. They gave her a couple, happy childhood, and she'd felt unloved. But there was something about connecting the dots of her lineage that had its own kind of satisfaction. Knowing who you come from, what they were like, it's anchored her in a way I hadn't expected. My life wasn't quite the same mystery. I knew both of my biological parents, and we had a pretty clear understanding of our family tree. Or so I thought. But something about the way my mother lit up, piecing together fragments of her past, made me wonder if there was more to uncover. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to give it a shot as well. I managed to convince my brother to join me in the genealogy deep dive, though he wasn't exactly thrilled about it. He had this weird thing about sending his DNA to a lab, muttering about how it was going to end up in some database sold to the highest bidder. I remember him going on about giant companies selling his genetic information for God knows what. He joked about waking up one day to find some creepy clone of him wandering around. I, on the other hand, couldn't care less. I mean, sure, privacy is important, but I figured we had bigger problems in the world than worrying about some lab tech messing with our DNA. It's not like it's tied to my social security number or anything, right? Months passed without much thought. My mother continued to obsess over her family tree, filling out branches that had been blank for decades. It became a project for her, a way to honor the past she hadn't been able to touch before. Meanwhile, my brother and I let the whole thing fade into the background. Then, one morning, an email from the genealogy site hit my inbox. My results were ready. I logged in, not really expecting anything out of the ordinary, but curiosity pushed me through the sign-in process. As expected, the usual suspect showed up. My brother, of course, despite all of his paranoia. My parents, my aunts, uncles, grandparents, a handful of cousins I barely kept in touch with. Some of the profiles have been filled in by other users on the site. My mother, naturally, seemed to have gotten everyone roped into her genealogy obsession. There were only a few distant relatives I didn't recognize. Some names had a faint familiar ring to them, but most were complete strangers. Still, nothing shocking. What caught my eye, though, were the names under my mother's biological family, the one we had never known about before. My biological grandparents were listed there. Confirmed by the DNA match, but both had passed away several years ago. I wasn't sure why, but seeing their names, people I've never met yet, shared a connection with, felt strange. Like suddenly there was a gap in my life that I hadn't known existed. While scrolling through the matches, one name caught my eye. A second cousin on my mother's side named Roger. I didn't recognize it. But that wasn't surprising since the whole branch of the family was still a mystery to me. For someone unfamiliar with genealogy, a second cousin is the grandchild of a grand-uncle or aunt. So Roger would have been connected to my mother's biological family, people we had never known about until recently. His profile wasn't fully filled out, which was odd considering... Most people on that site at least had basic information like birth years or locations. But one thing stood out clearly. Roger was alone. His side of the family tree had no other surviving members. Just a series of names that faded into the past, marked with dates of death. 
All the other relatives on my mother's biological side were deceased. It was unsettling to see that out of an entire branch of the family. This one person was all that was left. My mother had gone into this journey hoping to connect with relatives she had never known, and now it seemed like there wasn't much family left to meet. So much for her dream of reuniting with long-lost relatives. But at least she was happy, knowing where she came from, even if the connections she had hoped for were more distant than she had imagined. Roger, though, a lone name among the dead, lingered in my mind. Something about it stuck with me. Roger and I were on the same level of descendants, meaning he was probably around my age. It felt strange to think I might have a second cousin out there who I'd never met. Someone who shared a bloodline with me, but was, in every other sense, a stranger. Curiosity got the better of me, and I figured I'd reach out, according to his profile. Roger hadn't logged in for a few years, but I thought it was worth a shot anyway. Maybe he didn't know about the new matches, or maybe he just lost interest in genealogy over time. I spent a while crafting a message. I didn't want to come off as too pushy or make it weird. I explained my mother's situation, that she had been adopted, and after finding her biological family, I'd convinced the rest of us to join her on the website. I mentioned that we were probably second cousins and thought we'd never met. It might be fun to chat about shared interests, work, and other small talk. You know, family stuff. Even if we had never crossed paths before, we were connected by blood. And that had to count for something. To make things easier, I included my personal email in case he didn't want to bother logging back in into the site. Maybe he didn't even use it anymore, I thought, so this might give him a simpler way to respond. After one last read-through, I hit send and felt a little spark of excitement. Maybe this was the beginning of something interesting, a chance to connect with someone who shared a part of the family history I didn't know existed until recently. I wasn't expecting too much, but still, it felt like a step forward. Then, silent. Months passed and I never heard anything back from Roger. At first, I figured he was just busy or didn't check the site anymore. After all, his profile had been inactive for years when I found it. Over time, I paid it little mind, brushing it off as just another dead end in the process. I had done my part, and if he wanted to get in touch, he could. Just like Roger, our family's interest in genealogy websites faded over time. What had started as a fun dive into the unknown slowly fizzled out once we learned what could be gleaned from it. It had its moments, but like most fads, it didn't last, and eventually, we all stopped logging in. The family tree was built, the questions were answered, and that was that. By the time April came around, spring was in full swing. My mother, always the social butterfly, decided it was time for a big family get-together. Not just our immediate family, either. She convinced my father to host a gathering for our aunts, uncles, cousins, the whole extended clan. It had been a while since we'd all come together, and she was determined to make it happen. My parents still lived on the same 10-acre plot of land in the country, the house my brother and I had grown up in. Nothing much had changed over the years. My father still had his barn, which was more of a storage space for his collection of tools and machinery than anything else. The tractor he hadn't touched in years still sat there, gathering dust but somehow still had a point of pride for him. My mother kept herself busy with her garden, which was in full bloom by spring, and a small pen of three chickens that she used for eggs. It wasn't a farm exactly, but it kept her occupied and content. Every time I listened, she made sure to give me a tour of her plants and the chickens, like it was the first time I'd ever seen them. 
I lived about 40 miles away, closer to civilization and closer to work. The drive was easy enough and I made it regularly and the place always felt like a snapshot of my childhood. A place where everything stayed the same, even though life had moved on. Going back for family gatherings always stirred up a mix of nostalgia and distance. But this time, with the whole family expected to be there, it promised to be a bigger affair than usual. I arrived a little later than planned, pulled up to my parents' house to find dozens of cars already lined up along the gravel driveway and the grass on the side of the road. It looked like I was one of the last to show up, but that wasn't too surprising. I had hit some traffic on the way over. The house felt just as familiar as ever, but with all the cars and people milling about, it seemed more alive than usual. Out back, my dad had set up tables and chairs near my mom's garden and the chicken pen. He'd even dragged out a couple of old fold-out tables, their legs wobbly slightly on the uneven ground. People were already seated, chatting in little groups, their voices carrying across the yard in a constant hum of conversation. The smell of grilled meat wafted in the air, and for a moment I was reminded of summer cookouts from my childhood. My mom spotted me almost as soon as I stepped out of the car. She made a beeline towards me, a wide smile on her face, and pulled me into one of her trademark hugs. The kind that was warm and a little too tight but always made you feel like you were home. She kissed me on the cheek, patting my arm like she hadn't seen me in years. I'm so glad you made it, she said, her voice filled with excitement. Everyone's here. My dad followed behind her, more reserved but just as happy to see me. He extended his hand for a handshake, his grip firm as always, but before I could pull away, he pulled me in to a quick hug, clapping me on the back. It's good to see you, son, he said, his voice steady, as if he hadn't been waiting all day for me to show up. But I knew he had. I made my way through the backyard, mingling with family as I went. My aunts and uncles were scattered around, laughing and catching up like it hadn't been months since the last time we all got together. They welcomed me into their conversations, asking about work, life, and when I was going to settle down. You know, the usual stuff. Then, there were my cousins, people I used to hang out with all the time as a kid, but barely saw anymore. Back then, we spent our summers running wild on this very property, playing tag in the fields and building makeshift forts out of old wood my dad had stored in the barn. But now, with work and life taking over, we rarely had the chance to connect. Still, seeing them brought back all those memories, and for a while, it felt like old times, like we shared stories and laughed about things that seemed so far away from the present. The truth was, these big family gatherings felt a little distant to me now. The only people I really kept in touch with were my parents and my brother. Life had gotten busy, and the ties that used to feel strong had loosened over time. I wasn't sure when it had happened, but at some point, I just drifted off from everyone else. The big cousin group I used to hang out with, we'd barely exchange more than pleasantries at these events anymore. Not long after I arrived, my brother showed up with his family in tow. His two boys, my nephews, spotted me as soon as they hopped out of the car. They ran over with the kind of boundless energy only kids seem to have, giving me quick, enthusiastic hugs before darting off to join the other kids running around in the yard. It's good to see you, man, my brother said, walking up with his wife by his side. We hugged briefly and then fell into the usual conversation. We found a spot by the grill where the scent of sizzling burgers filled the air. With our drinks in hand, we started catching up. I told him about my job, how I'd been stuck in spreadsheets all day long, losing myself in numbers and data. It wasn't the most exciting gig, but it paid the bills. He gave me a sympathetic nod, but didn't seem too surprised. 
He knew my work had taken over most of my time. He told me about his sales job, how the company was doing well, and how he'd been hitting his targets consistently. Pays the bills, keeps the kids fed, he said with a grin. Not much more than you could ask for these days, right? Our conversation drifted more nostalgia, as it often did when we had a rare moment to talk without distractions. We reminisced about the days when we used to play Dungeons and Dragons together. Late nights, rolling dice around the kitchen table, getting lost in imaginary worlds, and of course, we talked about the time we spent in our old War of Warcraft guild, raiding dungeons and staying up late on school nights. For a moment, we both wished we could go back to those simpler times when the biggest worries we ever had were gear drops and dungeon bosses. Man, those were the days, he said, shaking his head with a smile. No real responsibilities, just games and good old times. Yeah, I agreed, staring out at the field where the kids were playing. Sometimes I wish we would hit pause and go back, even just for a little while. He smiled at that, but then he glanced over at his wife, who was chatting with our mom, and at his kids, who were laughing with the others. Yeah, but... I wouldn't trade this for the world, he said softly, nodding towards them. As much as I miss those days, I'm thankful for what I've got now. I smiled, understanding. Life had changed, and while things were more complicated now, there was beauty in it, too. Maybe I didn't have kids of my own, but I still see the fulfillment my brother had in his. It made me wonder if there was a part of my life I was missing. A little while later, my mother pulled me aside, her face lit up with the same excitement she always had when she wanted to show me something new. Come on, I have something to show you, she said, her voice bubbling with enthusiasm. I couldn't help but smile. My mom never did anything halfway. She walked across the yard, past her blooming garden, to a small corner of the property where she had set up a few beehives. Italian honeybees, she announced proudly. They're the best for pollinating gardens. Did you know they can visit up to 5,000 flowers in a single day? She was on a roll, rattling off facts about how these bees were more docile than any other types and how fast they were reproducing honey. She even started embellishing a little, as she often did when she really was into something. You know, bees communicate by dancing, and it's called the waggle dance. They can tell each other exactly where to find flowers with that. I nodded along, throwing in the occasional, That's great, Mom. Or, Wow, really? But honestly, I was only halfway paying attention. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and instinctively I pulled it out to check. I saw an email notification pop up on the screen. Uh, sorry, Mom, just a second, I said, holding up a hand. I, I just need to make sure it's not something important for work. She gave me a quick, understanding nod, though I could tell she was eager to keep talking about her bees. As she continued discussing how the bees were already working her garden, I glanced down at my phone and opened the email, apologizing quietly again for the interruption. It wasn't a work email. The sender's address was just a string of random numbers and letters, almost like someone had smashed their hands onto a keyboard. The domain it came from was just as nonsensical. No subject line, nothing to give away what it was about, just the cold, empty blank of an anonymous email. What really caught my attention, though, was the attachment. Against my better judgment, I tapped on the first one. It was the picture of me, taken just moments earlier. I was standing by my car. The same car that was now parked in my parents' driveway. My heart skipped a beat. I quickly swiped to the next image. Another picture of me, this time greeting my parents in the backyard. The next one was of me crouching down to hug my nephews. Their faces blurred as they darted away to play with the other kids. Then, another... 
This one showed me standing by the grill, talking with my brother, our drinks in hand, mid-conversation. Every photo was taken from a distance, but it was clear that whoever had snapped them had been watching. I kept scrolling, my fingers shaking silently, as each new image brought a fresh wave of dread. How long had someone been out there? How had they known I was here today? I felt the blood drain from my face and my stomach churned as I flipped through the pictures. A part of me wanted to believe it was some sick joke, but the pit in my gut told me otherwise. This wasn't a prank. Someone had been watching me, and they wanted me to know it. Hey, is everything okay? My mother asked, her voice snapping me back to the present. I must have looked pale as a ghost because her eyes were filled with concern. I tried to respond, but I couldn't find the words. I just stood there, staring at the screen, dumbstruck. Was this a joke? A sudden, piercing scream cut through the chatter, freezing everyone in place. It came from near the chicken coop. My aunt. Her voice was shrill, full of panic, and within seconds, all heads turned in that direction. I followed the others, my legs moving on instinct, as I shoved my phone back into my pocket. People were everywhere gathering around the small pen. My mother pushed through the crowd, her face contorted with worry. Then I saw it. All three of the chickens were sprawled in the straw, their bodies still, their feathers matted with blood. Each of their throats had been cleanly slit, their bodies limp, blood soaking into the straw below them. The air seemed to hang heavy with the coppery scent of death. My mother gasped, bringing her hand to her mouth, her eyes wide in shock. She had loved those chickens, fussed over them like they were her pets. Now they lay butchered in their pen, their tiny eyes snuffed out in the most violent way. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. I could hear my aunts and cousins murmuring in confusion, some of them crying, others backing away from the grim sight. My father was already inspecting the coop, looking for signs of what could have done this, but no fox or raccoon would have left them like this. This was deliberate. Someone had done this. I felt a sinking weight settle in my stomach. It wasn't just the dead chickens that disturbed me. It was the timing. I had just received those photos moments before this happened. I fumbled for my phone, my fingers clumsy as I pulled it back out, praying that what I had seen wasn't real. But as I looked down, my heart skipped a beat. The email was still there, staring back at me. Below the string of random numbers and letters, in the body of the message, were five simple words. It's nice to see family. I stood there feeling the world tilt around me, trying to piece together everything. The yard erupted into chaos. My aunts and uncles scrambled to usher the children inside, doing their best to shield them from the grisly sight. Some of the kids were confused, asking questions in nervous tones, while others started crying once they realized something was wrong. The adults tried to keep it together, voices hushed but frantic as they worked to keep the panic from spreading. My mother was beside herself, tears streaming down her face as she stood frozen, staring at the covered chicken pen in disbelief. Who would do this? She kept asking, her voice shaking and broken. Why would anyone do this? I put an arm around her, trying to calm her down but her hands were trembling too much to even hold on to me. Mom, it's okay, I whispered, though I wasn't even sure I believed that myself. We'll figure it out. Dad's handling it. Meanwhile, my father had grabbed a tarp from his garage and draped it over the chicken pen, hiding the grisly scene. He worked quickly, his face grim and determined. I could tell he was upset, but he wasn't letting it show. Not yet. Not in front of everyone.
For now, the goal was to keep the peace and let people get back to the gathering without worrying about what had just happened. At least until they left. But I could not let it go. I had to tell them what I knew. Once, most of the kids were inside and the commotion had died down a bit. I pulled my parents and my brother aside, away from the others. I hesitated for a moment, trying to find the right words. Then, without saying anything, I showed them my phone, flipping it open to the email with the photos. The pictures of me arriving, the pictures of me greeting my parents, the pictures of me playing with my nephews, laughing with my brother. I watched as their faces turned pale, the realization sinking in. I think whoever sent these took the photos from over there. I pointed off the property, toward the tree line, that lined the back of my parents' land. There was something dark and ominous about it now. I didn't notice anything at first, but the angle. It has to be from that direction. They were silent, eyes flickering between me and the tree line. There's something else, I continued, my voice lower, almost hesitant to say it out loud. You remember Roger, the second cousin I found on the genealogy website? I reached out to him months ago, but I never heard back. He's the only living relative on mom's biological side. It could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. My mother wiped her tears, confused. <laughs> what are you saying? I took a deep breath. I'm saying, unless someone in our family decided to play a sick joke, which doesn't make sense, none of us would do something like this. Then, it might be Roger. He's the only one we don't know. My brother shook his head slowly, the disbelief clear on his face. This doesn't make any sense. Why would he do something like this? I mean, he didn't even respond to you. I don't know, I said, swallowing hard, the words catching in my throat. But whoever sent this knows us. They've been watching. We all stood there in heavy silence, the weight of the situation settling over us like a dark cloud. My mother looked like she might collapse, her face pale and her hands trembling as she stared at the email on her phone. She had gone quiet, processing what I had just said about Roger, about the photos, about everything. My father, seeing the state she was in, didn't waste any time. He immediately pulled out his phone and started dialing the police. His jaw clenched tight. He walked a few steps away as he spoke to the dispatcher explaining that something strange was going on, that someone had been watching us. I turned to my brother, but before I could say anything, he was already shaking his head. I knew this was a bad idea, he muttered, a voice tight with frustration. I told you I didn't trust that genealogy site. Putting your DNA, our family out there, it's like handing over your entire life to strangers. His words hit me like a slap, and I could feel the frustration bubbling up inside me. You think I wanted this? I snapped, trying to keep my voice down but failing. How was I supposed to predict this? I was just trying to help mom find her family. None of us thought it would lead to this. He was angry, and so was I. But before we could say anything else, he turned away from me and started gathering his family. I'm taking them home, he said, his voice colder than I'd heard in a long time. This is too much for my kids. They didn't see the chickens, and I'm not letting them get dragged into this mess or questioned by the police. Call us if you need anything, but we're leaving. My mother looked at him, panic flickering in her eyes. Please don't go, she said, her voice shaky. We're all scared, but we need to stick together. I get that, Mom, he said, softening for a moment as he put a hand on her shoulder. But I've got to think about them, he added, nodding toward his wife and kids, who were already heading to the car. This is just too much. 
My father had finished his call with the police and walked over just in time to hear my brother say he was leaving. You don't have to go, he said, his voice firm but pleading. We can handle this together. But my brother was already set. No, Dad, I'm sorry, but I can't risk this with my family. I stood there watching helplessly as my brother ushered his wife and kids into the car. He gave me a quick, curt nod before sliding into the driver's seat and starting the engine. Without another word, they pulled away, the car kicking up dust as they disappeared down the long driveway. Silence after they left was deafening. My parents stood there, looking smaller somehow, like the weight of everything was finally sinking in. We were left to face whatever this was, and I wasn't sure how to make sense of any of it. The police arrived about 20 minutes later, their flashing lights cutting through the fading daylight as they pulled up to the house. Two officers stepped out of the car, their expressions serious, as they made their way over to us. My father met them first, shaking their hands and leading them toward the chicken coop. The rest of us hovered nearby, waiting for some sort of direction, but it was clear that one of us knew what to expect. They moved methodically, walking around the coop and the perimeter of the yard, looking for any sign of an intruder. They checked the tree line where I thought the photos had been taken, but after a while they came back empty-handed. I'm sorry, no footprints, no sign of anyone, one of the officers said, glancing at his partner. If someone were out here, they didn't leave much behind. Frustration welled up inside me. Whoever did this had to have been watching us. They had taken photos, they had killed the chickens, but there was nothing to go on. It felt like a dead end. I pulled out my phone again, showing the officers the email I had received. This is what I got, I said, handing it over. The sender's address is just a random string of letters and numbers, and it came with these photos. They were taken right here, today, while we were all outside. I scrolled through the pictures, one by one, letting the officer see each one. The officers exchanged a look before turning back to me. And you said this started after you reached out to a relative on a genealogy website? One of them asked. Yeah, I nodded. Months ago. His name is Roger. He's the only living relative on my mom's biological side. I never heard back from him, though, and now this. I gestured to the phone and then the goop, feeling helpless. The officers took down everything I told them, writing notes and asking follow-up questions about the email and the website. We'll try to trace the email and see where it leads, one of them said. It might take some time, but we'll do what we can. They moved on to questioning the rest of the family, going through each relative, asking if anyone had seen anything unusual that day. But it was the same story from everyone. No one had noticed anything out of the ordinary. The only thing that had drawn attention was the scream from my aunt when she discovered the chickens. I could see the officers getting frustrated too. It was like the intruder had left no trace, no sign that they had even been there apart from the pictures and the blood-soaked straw beneath the tarp-covered coop. As they wrapped up their questioning, I felt a gnawing sense of unease settle deeper into my gut. Whoever did this had been watching us, watching me, and now we had no idea who it was or when they might have come back. The aunt that had screamed was my father's sister, my mother's sister-in-law, the same one who had helped my mother incubate and hatch these chickens just a few months earlier. They'd worked together to raise them, nurturing them like pets. For my mom, losing them like this wasn't just an act of cruelty. It was personal. She stood by the coop, still visibly shaken, leaning on my dad for support as the police finished up. Most of the family had already left by the time the sun started dipping below the horizon. My brother had been gone for a while, and now my aunts, uncles, and cousins were beginning to trickle out, one by one, all of them casting nervous glances toward the tree line as they made their way to their cars. 
I lingered, wanting to stay behind, to help and make sure everything was in order before I left. After the police had taken their final notes and left the scene, it was just me, my parents, and the empty yard. My father and I set about cleaning up the mess. We wrapped the remains of the chickens carefully, trying to be as respectful as possible, though it felt like a grim task. My mother watched from a distance, still in shock, her eyes hollow as she stared at the pen that now stood lifeless. Once the chickens were taken care of, I spent the next hour or so trying to reassure her, telling her over and over again that everything would be all right. The police are on it, Mom, I said, rubbing her back as we sat on the porch. They'll find whoever did this. It will be okay. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. And truth be told, neither was I. The words I was saying felt empty, felt hollow. How could I reassure her when I was terrified myself? My stomach was twisted in knots, my mind racing with every worst-case scenario. Whoever had done this had been close, watching us, taking pictures, waiting for the right moment, and the police hadn't found anything. No sign of them. It felt like we were just waiting for the next move, blind to where it might have come from. But I couldn't let my mom see how scared I was. So I stayed as long as I could, sticking close to her and doing my best to offer comfort, even if it was only surface level. When it was finally time to go, I hugged her tight, promising to check in tomorrow and reminding her to lock the doors. I got into my car and drove away, glancing nervously in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see someone lurking in the shadows. The entire drive home, my heart pounded in my chest, and the email's words echoed in my head. It's nice to see family. Even though I had tried to reassure her, I was scared to my core. Every word of comfort I offered my mom felt like a lie, a desperate attempt to mask the growing dread that was gnawing at me. As I drove home, the familiar winding country road seemed darker than usual the trees on either side casting long shadows across the pavement. My mind kept replaying the events of the day. The dead chickens, the photos, the chilling email. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was still watching, lurking just out of sight. About halfway home, my phone buzzed again, jolting me from my thoughts. I instinctively reached for it, my hand trembling as I unlocked the screen. My breath caught in my throat when I saw the notification. Another email. Like the first one, the sender was a string of random characters, impossible to trace. My pulse quickened and my stomach churned as I stared at the message. Drive safe. That was all it said. Two words, but they were enough to send a cold wave of terror washing over me. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked up from the screen, scanning the empty road ahead. My headlights cut through the darkness, but everything beyond that was shrouded in shadow. Whoever had sent the email, whoever had killed those chickens, taken those pictures, they were still watching. They knew where I was, what I was doing, and now they were reaching out again, reminding me, that I wasn't alone. I swallowed hard, my hands tightening on the steering wheel as I glanced nervously in the rearview mirror. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. No cars trailing behind me, no figures hiding in the trees. But it didn't matter. The feeling of being watched clung to me, suffocating in its intensity. My mind raced. Had they followed me from my parents' house? Were they out there now, just beyond the reach of my headlights, waiting for the next moment to strike? My stomach twisted with fear and I found myself driving faster, desperate to reach the safety of home. I wanted to pull over, to stop and catch my breath, 
But the thought of being stranded out here, alone on the dark road, was worse. I kept driving, every sense on high alert, my heart thudding in my ears. I needed to get home. I needed to be somewhere safe, somewhere with locked doors and walls between me and whatever this was. As I neared the edge of town, the lights of civilization finally flickered on the horizon. But the fear didn't ease. Not really. The message haunted me. Drive safe. It wasn't a threat, but it was worse somehow. It was a reminder that they were always there, always watching, and that no matter where I went, I wasn't beyond their reach. I pulled into my driveway, parking quickly and rushing inside, locking the door behind me the second I stepped through. I leaned against it, breathing hard, my mind still reeling. I checked the windows, turned on every light, but no amount of reassurance could stop the cold knot of fear tightening in my chest. I glanced at my phone one last time the screen still glowing with the words that had shaken me to my core. Drive safe. For the first time, I realized that safety was no longer something I could take for granted. Not anymore. Whoever this was, they weren't done, and I had no idea what they were planning next. To be continued... Thank you all so much for indulging in this three plus hour Halloween compilation. The very first thing I would like to do is acknowledge our elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita B, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise Thess, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you for remaining the pillars of which this channel stands. To the other subscribers, for the first time listeners, or for anyone peeking in to check this channel out, thank you for your support, for without you, I would not have a voice, and this channel would not exist. As I said just moments earlier, this will be continued. This is already a rather long video, and I wanted to get it up so you would have something for Halloween. But trust and believe, part two is coming next, and that involves the 20 part story that I really want you to hear. So, if you are sleeping, I hope Slumber Lane is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a frightful night. Peace, love, and light to you all.